It oak might trees be. It there. looks very Davisy. I was just questioning if that's actually. The lighting Davis. is spooky. Um, the lighting between the trees. How many ghosts are in that picture, Justin? At least six. <laughs> no ghosts. This is this is not a paranormal program. <laughs> I mean, it's hardly a normal program. This is the recording for the This Week in Science podcast. And if you are joining us right now, you are in for a great show. We are recording tonight, which means that anything that happens over the next couple of hours may or may not end up in the final podcast, but you get to see it all. So I hope that you do enjoy the show. Everyone, are we ready to do a show? Mm -hmm. Oh, is that tonight? It's, it's tonight. We can do this. Yes, we can make shows happen. Yes, okay. Although my iTunes doesn't want to. It does not. Yeah, I heard that. <laughs> bloop, bloop. <laughs> but at least we have confirmation Don't. that my mixer is working. <sighs> <sighs> All right, let's start the show, everyone. In a three. Oh, wait, let me check first. Identity four, is my audio level loud enough? Or am I even? Check, 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 check. Justin, can you say something? Something, something, so something, 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 something. And something. Blair. Testing, one, two, three. To a Tara. <laughs> to a Tara, to the Vocal max. Vocal fry coming in loud and clear. <laughs> oh, boy. Listen, listen, when the vocal fry shows up, you know it. You don't have to wonder. I didn't wonder. I heard it. <laughs> I heard it. I got it. You're slipping. You're slipping. Uh, Just letting you know. Sounds great. Okay, <laughs> now we have the go-ahead. <laughs> Starting in a three, a two. This is twists this week in science episode number 786 recorded on wednesday august 12th 2020 twists explains the universe hi everyone i'm dr kiki and tonight on this week in science we will fill your head with tiny cleaners giant alligators and placebos but first disclaimer 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 People worry, what are they worrying about today? People worry, what are they worrying about today? People worry, what? Oh, the coronavirus is still experiencing exponential growth in the United States and politicians while canceling political rallies are encouraging children to attend in-person schooling. And there's a safety stimulus thing that's been stalled where there's like 100 million people about to go homeless from eviction and you know, global warming is still a serious threat. Yeah, but nobody's talking about that right now. And Arecibo, yes, yes, I know what Arecibo is. That's the world's second largest telescope located in Puerto Rico, uh, currently tracking a very dangerous uh, asteroid that is the size of five football fields or 80 tennis courts, if you prefer that. What, what do you mean it just got ripped in half by a loose tension Cord thing. Oh, okay. So maybe there is a good reason to worry, worry, worry. But one thing which you need not worry or fret is that This Week in Science is coming up next. I've got the kind of mind that can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go to find the knowledge I seek. I want to know what's happening, what's happening, what's happening this week in science. What's happening, what's happening, what's happening this week in science. Good science to you, Kiki and Blair. And a good science to you too, Justin, Blair, and everyone out there. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Science. We are back. That's right. We are back. We said I'll be back, and now we are back with science because science never sleeps. And sometimes I don't either, and that's probably not good for me because science says sleep is good. But let's talk about the science, okay? I brought stories about white dwarfs placebos and we have a guest tonight to explain the universe to us mm, oh good one wave at daniel whitesen 
<laughs> the whole universe will be explained this evening. Awesome. Okay, Justin, <laughs> what did you? Show. We should have done this interview first, and then we probably wouldn't have need to done the rest. Uh, oh, what I, got? I have, uh, I have the giant, uh, enormous alligators of North America. Uh, I have, ooh, I have a, a homelessness story uh, that has uh, no upside, and then a thing about. Uh, something about the research that's been done to keep us our brains from ever aging. Uh, you might, I don't know if it's this. You did you bring that story too? Because it's a neurology story. I don't know if then look over and see if you've gotten that one snuck in there. If it's about dolphins, I have a story about no, dolphins. It's not. This one's in mice. Okay. Well, it's for humans, but okay. okay, yeah, mine's about dolphins. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about these nice. things just and a more. bit later and more. Oh, as we jump in. Oh, Blair, what's in the animal corner? I was I was like, oh, I'm not on this show. Great. Good night. Oh. Dolphins, <laughs> mice. I mean, we already talked about all the animals. Come on. Okay. Uh, what's I have in the two, animal corner? The two tiny cleaners that you mentioned. I have two Ataras and shrinking fish. Shrinking fish. They must be related to my white dwarfs. Could Perhaps. Be. We'll see. We will see. All right. As we jump into the show, I would love to remind you that if you are not yet subscribed to This Week in Science, you can find us all places that podcasts are found. We have a YouTube channel and we're on Facebook. Just look for This Week in Science. You can go to our website at twistwis.org. Okay, let's jump into those quick gold stories. Do, do, do. Hey! Where there is water, there might be life, right? And it could be, yeah, could, be could be, maybe everywhere might, here there is everywhere here water. there absolutely is. Yeah. Well, a series of papers in Nature this week support the idea that a salty ocean, probably muddy and salty, exists beneath the icy surface of Ceres, the ball of ice that floats just past the mass, just past Mars in the asteroid belt was imaged by the Dawn mission, which showed variations in this Texas diameter planetesimals gravitational field that are indicative of pockets of salt water, which is very cool because it was thought that once upon a time there was an ocean underneath the frosty ice surface, but they were like, oh, well, it's probably frozen up and it's not there anymore. <gasps> but evidence says that it is. So additionally, they have some high-resolution re images that also tell a story of these ancient impacts that occurred that cracked that icy shell and allowed some of that salt water to seep up to the surface where it's visible today. And Dawn actually first imaged those these spots as white spots. They were reflective white spots on the surface of Ceres. We were like, what are those things? Could it be water? And indeed, oh. they really think it is. Back in 2015 was when it was first imaged. The finding implies, because it's water, salt water, that the conditions for life could be closer to Earth than previously thought. So instead of having to send missions way out to Jupiter or Saturn, we could be going to the asteroid belt. That image of Ceres was one of my favorite astronomical images because the first one I got that showed the bright spot also made it look like it was a pyramid. Like, not just something that looked a little bit like a pyramid, but like a serious, like Egyptian pyramid. <laughs> and so for a while, it felt like we were in the beginning of a science fiction novel, you know, where they're like, why is there an obelisk? You know, uh, it was pretty <laughs> exciting. But, you know, then they took pictures from the other side and it didn't look nearly as much as the pyramid. Like a pyramid. Oh, did, you they should have never. Triangulation reimaged. and yeah. multiple they, points of data collection. Oh. They never should have reimaged <laughs> the face on Mars. They should have just been like, yeah, that's there. Deal with it. <laughs> Yeah, some of these high-resolution images, one of them, uh, they've been able to determine that there is a mountain near one of the white spots that's like 21,000 feet, feet, meters, feet tall, I think. I, my units of measurement are not accurate in my <laughs> memory at the moment. That's a really big moment. mountain. <laughs> exactly. But it's, oh, it's, it's, it's a lot taller of than, big. it's bigger than Denali. It's very tall, very high on a little tiny Texas diameter dwarf planet, yeah, which pretty, crazy. pretty yeah. cool. It's amazing. I think a lot of people don't realize how much water there is out there. Like we think of water as an earth thing, but really there's like huge amounts of water out there in the solar system. Of course, most of it is ice, right? But there's a lot of water out there. So there really are a lot of places where life could still exist in our solar system. That's incredible, right? 
Our yeah. water may have come from somewhere else. Oh, absolutely. It very likely did because yeah. early Earth like probably boiled off most of its water. So we're swimming in, you know, oceans of melted comets, most likely. Yes. I like wow. thinking of that. I'm going to go comet ocean swimming. <laughs> yes. I'm gonna I will remember that next time I go swimming. Yes. All right, Justin, tell me about these ancient alligators of North America. Okay, this is a new study. It's at, uh, revisiting some fossil specimens that were previously collected uh, and some new finds of this enormous cro crocodilian. It's sort of, like, it's a uh, dinosuchus, which is, they're calling it a crocodilian, although they're also going to say uh, in the study that it much more re re resembles uh, a modern day alligator in terms of, but still, whatever it is. Uh, they, they found that the, this thing's teeth, finally. They found a sa sample of these teeth, which they are describing as banana-sized teeth. Which, which <laughs> Those are some big, big jumpers, yeah. Those are <laughs> really big teeth. Uh, and then you can get start to get a feel of how, because you can picture a crocodile in your head. The teeth are not that big. So this is, you know, scaling up. You have, <laughs> right. So it's 33 feet in length, this thing. <laughs> Uh, they also, they review, they, this is published in the Journal of uh, Vertebrae and Paleontology. It also reveals that there were different kinds of them for different species that lived in the America, uh, North America. There were two species that lived in West America that ranged from Montana to Northern Mexico. Uh, there was another that lived in Atlantic coastal plain from New Jersey to Mississippi, uh, which at the time they're saying this uh, North America had and this time frame, where's my time frame? 75 to 82 million years ago, there was a shallow sea that connected the Arctic Ocean with the Gulf of Mexico. So there was, which I did, that's a fun fact. Uh, I had no idea that that was there, uh, but it explains the predominance of these, these giant alligators. Yeah. They'd, they'd previously found remains of other dinosaurs or of dinosaurs that had these bite marks on them that they hadn't been able to really connect to anything. And now they're sure, yes, this thing was eating everything. It could <laughs> eat the biggest predatory dinosaur uh, in its environment 80 million years ago. Not a problem. This thing was an apex predator and it lived in water and would hang out there. So, you know, dinosaurs, they needed to drink probably, you know, probably takes a while for a dinosaur to get a decent uh, drink of water, right? For that size. It needs they a lot of melted comet. <laughs> it needs a lot of melted comet to keep the dinosaurs fueled up. So, so they had to go near the water and then these things would be waiting. One of the interesting things that I kind of uh, found about this was, or that they discovered in this that I found interesting was they found these two holes at the front that they haven't really, it's a feature that they don't quite, they don't see on modern alligators or crocodiles today uh it had this enlarged nose area and these two holes that they can't i'm sort of picturing them though if i'm going to guess and speculate here hmm. that they have like nostril snorkels because you can sort of see it already like the way a crocodile or an, uh, an alligator will sort yeah. of hover under the water with just eyes maybe a little bit of nose up there so if you can have a snorkel that went up even better and then you could really hide because you don't want the predatory dinosaur to see you first. There's a chance a T-Rex or something could make the meal out of you. You really got to sneak up while being 33 feet long. It's a, it's a tough balance. So modern day saltwater crocodiles, the largest of the current crocodilians, they can get to be about 20 feet long. So not nearly no, not this bad. big, but still pretty darn big. Mm -hmm. And they also do have, they have the kind of the bulb at the front where their nostrils mm -hmm. are. So their ears, their eyes, and their nose are all just above water. And they can stay in very shallow water, these giant 20 feet crocodilians and so they um they blend in really well in the muddy water and a gazelle comes up to drink or whatever and bam so it's it's a pretty similar strategy just i guess extra large especially yeah. with those banana sized teeth gotcha yeah. gazelle yeah Arr. that's really something like i you, you go okay banana sized teeth then like picture <clears throat> holding a banana <laughs> yeah that's one tooth <laughs> that's a singular tooth <laughs> Did you these have guys to have a eat very large head. prehistoric bananas? 
Yeah, yeah. Right. They during this, they ate everything. They ate absolutely everything. They ate whatever they it. wanted. <laughs> yeah, they, they did. So what happened uh, to them? Why aren't they around anymore? So that's a great question. So they don't know. So they apparently, so far, uh, they're, they dis they think they have disappeared before the meteor impact. Uh, that that the, the before the the event that knocked out the dinosaurs, right? So they don't have that as its endpoint. It seems to end sometime before this. So who knows? Well, maybe we're talking a climate thing where the inland sea dries up. I don't know. They don't. There, know. Ha so there has still... been speculation that there was climate uh, change going on before the asteroid hit. And mm -hmm. so the asteroid just exacerbated what was already a slow decline. So, you know, who knows? There could be. Yeah. Who, I mean, who you got, knows? You've got dinosaurs in Montana. And, and mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's pretty far north for for uh, a big, big guy like that. But uh, so one of the, the other things they're saying, it was a uh, big teeth. It, sh it was they, they say it was kind of interesting because its snout was long and very broad, but inflated at the front around the nose in a way not seen in other crocodilian living or extinct. So more of they, a snorkel. Well, they're sort of the, the yeah, could have been the snorkel, but it, it, it's also showing that the snapshot that we have uh, in our heads of the current crocodiles being unchanged throughout time, uh, this is a very radically different part of that lineage mm -hmm. that shows eh, we got to keep thinking of everything being as evolved as us. Everything mm -hmm. has had this much time to go through evolution and to make adjustments. Uh, although, mm -hmm. yeah, it looks like the at least it's. It's hunting practice uh, may not have changed in all of this time. Yeah, it's the sit and wait predator is an efficient own. method for sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, I've been sitting and waiting here to hear about these tiny cleaners. Oh, that yes. You brought. Oh, yes, 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 yes. So, a lot of people don't realize that coral are animals, but hopefully, listeners to the show would be familiar by now that I've hammered it into everyone's brain enough times. So, corals are animals, they're actually little polyps. They, um, they look almost like teeny, teeny, tiny anemones. Um, and so they can, they're filter feeders. They can grab onto little particulates in the water like that. They come out of the little coral shell and grab little bits and they can suck back in when they're, they're, um, something swims by or they want to protect themselves or any number of things. So that's how a coral polyp works. And so um, this is a study from the University of Warwick led by Eidenhoven University of Technology in the Netherlands. They wanted to turn this technology that we see in corals, use some biomimicry and turn that into something that we could use. So they actually developed a one centimeter by one centimeter wireless artificial aquatic polyp that can remove contaminants from water. They have a rotating magnetic field under the device that drives a rotating motion of the artificial polyp stem that then results in a generation of attractive flow, which guides targets like oil droplets towards the polyp. And then a UV light is used to activate the polyp's tentacles, which uh, has photoactive active liquid crystal polymers that bend towards the light and closing the passing target in the polyp's grasp. And then you can also release the target with blue light. So they think that they, they'll be able to clean out water, but even more interestingly, potentially, is that they also think they could use this technology in medical diagnostic devices by, a, by being able to pick up and transport specific cells. Wow. Wait, wait, specific cells? Mm -hmm. like, that's yeah, they're amazing. that tiny. They're that specific. I wonder if they would use, uh, in order to catch specific cells, if they would use chemical attractants or, you know, like Im immunological uh, markers or antigens to be able to, to do that kind of capture. I wonder how they would, how they would go about manag yeah. managing to pick out certain cells over others. Yeah. I they probably have machine know. learning in there like everything else these days, right? Mm, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you could learn from its experience. <laughs> that, and somebody probably needs, that and somebody needs to stir it with a hand crank to keep the fluids <laughs> rotating around okay. long enough for it to come into contact. That's so probably, yeah, a combination yeah. of yeah. technologies involved. High sure. tech and low tech. Sure. Yeah, so little coral polyps cleaning the ocean, potentially saving your life.
Right. That's amazing because corals are going extinct. So we have to make <laughs> synthetic ones. Oh, no. <laughs> Well, the oceans are going to die, our, and so are all the corals. <laughs> our synthetic uh, trees that we're going to make that are going to be solar panels and uh, also uh, convert yeah. uh, carbon dioxide into oxygen. Or, we're just uh, going to photosynthesis yeah. instead. Let's just Bio, create a fake world. Just start it all Mimicry for the future. <laughs> we will win. Or we could change our ways, but we could, we could. We could. So <laughs> yeah, I was going to People talk change. about. I was yeah. going to talk about the uh, damaged Arecibo dish, but Justin brought that up in the. Oh, I just mentioned it. I don't bring anything more about yeah. it. Yeah. So just really, you you got the big details in the middle of the night on August tenth. A steel support cable snapped, and it was pulled taut, so it went spring, and then flopped around because there was a bunch of tension in the wire. Mm -hmm. And because it's a steel cable supporting this massive 307 meter dish, um, it ended up destroying a 30 meter section of the Arecibo radio telescope. And so <laughs> the pictures of it are awful. There's just bits and pieces of the, the dish on the ground. Um, and a, an additional antenna called the Gregorian Dome was also damaged. And the telescope is totally offline until repairs can be made, and they don't know whether that's going to be days or weeks. What if the aliens are calling us right now? Uh, out of luck. Well, well, if the aliens are calling us right now, we do have other telescopes that are radio astronomy telescopes that are looking out in the way that Arecibo does. And actually, as Arecibo has been kind of fighting for its survival for several years because there are larger telescopes now. There are more accurate, more powerful telescopes. There's, yeah, there's one larger. Yes. And there but, but there are others, but there are others yeah. in planning. Um and more so more sophisticated. More but, sophisticated. Ah. Yeah. But, but, but the, and so yeah, really the, the, it's the funding. NIH has yeah. uh not NIH, NSF has pulled back funding. Uh they are not funding it as much. The University of Florida started funding it more. Uh but now with this damage, we'll see. Hopefully it will continue to do wonderful work because Arecibo, it's amazing. And how much can it really cost? I mean, compared to a fighter jet or whatever. Yeah, no, it's so how about, cheap. It's so, so much cheap. Less. It's it's uh yeah. It's ridiculously when people we had who we had one of the engineers from NASA. On, I know this is the quick story, right? But we had an engineer from NASA on who did mission plan, who's talking budgets with us about what it costs to put like a probe on Mars. It was like it was we were talking to build this thing was less than a house in in my town. Like to put a thing on another planet that can go explore was so ridiculously inexpensive. Mm -hmm. uh, it just it and if we can, it must be frustrating we, to be a scientist trying to plan these things. And <laughs> to look out month. for to look out for those potential asteroids that are on a path for our planet, or not. But how do we know they're out there if we're not looking? So well, I tell you how we know because I I kind of left this part out of the disclaimer because it's more fun. Uh, before getting destroyed, they had already determined uh, through SIBO that it was not going to be nearly as close of no. uh, a swing by as we had maybe predicted the last time it came up. So it already did that really important job, but let's not forget, that might not be the only thing that ever comes by our neighborhood <laughs> if we have a thing that can tell us whether or not we should be trying to do something or prepare, uh, it's worth having, Ron. It's worth it, totally. Worth fixing. How would you prepare? <laughs> I'd make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. <laughs> I'd finally think I'd I think I'd finally convince uh, my friends to go in with me and buy one of those abandoned nuclear uh, silos. There we <laughs> go. Go underground. Deep underground. <laughs> we'll see. Or, is that, or is that like the worst idea? You don't know what's going to flood. Maybe you want the highest mountain, and then all that. I don't know. I don't know how you hide from a from a eighty tennis court wide thing that's coming towards the earth you call <laughs> elon and go into space <laughs> yeah uh, well There's speaking of more space stuff 12 billion years ago there was a galaxy like the milky way 12 billion years ago something a spiral galaxy ordered not chaotic very nice looking some something you'd bring home to meet your parents 
it's super weird because we've never found anything quite as ordered that far back in time before. So this is, you know, a couple of billion that years after the start yeah. of the universe. Which so, sounds like a long time until you like got to form a whole neat little social, like is a uh, galaxy like that. Is this going to push back the age of everything? I don't think it'll push back the age of everything, but I think it just, in terms of galaxy formation, it does pose some interesting questions as to what forces, and Daniel, you can maybe correct me here if I'm thinking incorrectly, but what forces would be necessary uh, to to lead to an ordered structure as, as opposed to a more chaotic structure in the early, more energetic phase of the universe? I mean, this is a period of time when that the galaxy had a, a large amount, the area of space the galaxy is in, there's a large amount of star formation, it's super active, and normally when that's going on, you don't, ex it's going to be dusty and gassy and bushy, not all neatly spiraled up like, a, like, you know, Princess Leia's hair buns. <laughs> yeah, and these spiral galaxies often form from mergers. Like you get a couple little proto galaxies that come together and they have angular momentum. You get those spirals. So it just takes time. I mean, like how long would it take you to make a spiral galaxy, right? You'd a still very be doing long it time. in a billion years or so. Yeah. So you're right. It's fascinating to look that far back and be like, wow, there already were galaxies because they run the simulations and they can't really explain how you get that stuff so early. Like not just the galaxies, but also the supermassive black holes in the centers of galaxies. Some of them are already like a billion times the mass of the sun when the universe is like a billion years old. And they just, they don't know how to make them that big that fast. So it's it's fascinating. Yeah, the biggest ones, are, uh, the, what are, I was looking at some infographic that was showing like a six and a half billion or more, like, like just when you start to contemplate, those are talking about <laughs> solar masses. And those yeah. billions of yeah. that's a big collection because even really one solar collection. mass is ridiculously mm. big right it's like well you know, to us to us okay to us, to us. yeah exactly. but to a big black hole that's <laughs> don't even it's notice nothing. it that's that's it's breakfast a yeah, exactly. right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so but what so what do we base this uh the age of our universe on if not the the oldest uh structured things uh that we can see yeah, well, that's a great question. We do it a few ways. One is what is the oldest thing out there? But these aren't the oldest things. The oldest things out there are things like the cosmic microwave background radiation, which is even older. It's like 400,000 years from the beginning of the universe. But then we also, we just look at the expansion. We're like, the universe is expanding. Let's just run the clock backwards, you know, and see when T equals zero is. So there's a few ways that we measure the age of the universe. And the cool thing is they they mostly agree, you know, to within a couple hundred million years, give or take. So that's, that's pretty, pretty awesome. That sounds pretty good, yeah. Yeah. That's very awesome. I, I keep wondering, if there were ordered galaxies that far back, what does this mean for intelligent life in the universe? Mm. <sighs> dun, dun, dun. Yeah. yeah. Just put that yeah. thought out there. All right, Justin, tell me a not oh. very uplifting story. Well, we can't. Uh, it's already... Uh, <laughs> Well, I can save this one for the second half because okay. we're already talking. Maybe. We're already talking, uh, learning everything about the universe with Daniel. I think we should just stick with it. <laughs> I'll do the I'll do the, the buzzkill story after the interview. First buzz, then kill. All yeah. right. So for those of us who do, I'll, I have one more quick story for those of us who do want to live as long as we can. Uh, well. Yeah, Blair is very excited at I'm this here one. For it. Yes, you are. Um, so, could we slow down aging if we knew what the indicators of accelerated aging are? Scientists have been trying to address this question by studying dolphins. Of course, they were. Well, actually, dolphins have lifespans that are long, like humans, and so they make a great comparable species to look at. And so they did a longitudinal 25-year study, and a, they looked at 144 dolphins that were housed by the U.S. Navy. Because, yes, we all know this, the U.S. Navy loves dolphins. They uh, measured a bunch of stuff in the blood and found four markers that can be used to measure aging differences in dolphins. 
Not in people, just dolphins. Hemoglobin, lymphocytes, platelets, and alkaline phosphatase. Alkaline phosphatase is indicator of uh, liver function. Platelets are a blood factor, lymphocytes, immune factor, hemoglobin, that's your red blood cells. Um, and as people age faster, often there's, uh, they become hemoglobin deficient, and this, is, this it leads to age-related anemia. So these levels indicated faster or slowing aging dolphins. And if these same markers can apply to humans and are aging, then maybe... Doctors and others can look at stuff like hemoglobin to inform the development of treatments for things like age-related anemia. So potentially, these factors could go on to help us live longer lives. If we're dolphins. If we're dolphins, yes. Which I definitely want to retire to the U.S. Navy's dolphin nursing home. That sounds like a great place to hang out. <laughs> Well, if you've read uh, David Brin's Uplift novels, everyone would love to be a dolphin because they end up being uplifted to sentient species anyway, eventually. So it's great. Yes. Did you just spoil the whole series right there? What? <laughs> no. <laughs> what? Me? It's an old Spoiler. book. Everyone has to have read it by now. Okay. <sighs> if you just tuned in, you are listening to This Week in Science. And if you're interested in a twist shirt or a mug or other item of our merchandise, you can head over to twist.org and click on the Zazzle link. We have face masks also. Twist masks. Show the world you care about them and that you love twists. All right. I would love to now finally really officially introduce our guest for the show. Dr. Daniel Whiteson is a professor of physics and astronomy at UC Irvine, where he investigates questions related to the fundamental nature of our universe using experimental high-energy physics. Things smashing together. Whiteson is a part of the Atlas collaboration at the Large Hadron Collider, created an app to turn cell phones into cosmic ray detectors, and has published several comics and books attempting to explain the universe. You might know him as Daniel from the podcast called Daniel and Jorge Explain the Universe. Welcome to the show. Thanks very much for having me on. You're welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight. It's just wonderful to have an expert in the universe join our show. <laughs> I have an all-encompassing expertise. That's right. <laughs> no, we like, to talk, we like to talk on our podcast about basically everything inside the universe. And so that's why we went with that very broad name. I think I think that makes sense. But how did you initially become interested in the universe? In the universe? Well, uh, I live in the universe. Mm. And okay. I figured I'd like to understand it. And I have some questions. And I never really got answers to those questions. You know, I, um, I grew up in Los Alamos, New Mexico, the home mm -hmm. of the National Lab of the Manhattan Project. So physics was sort of always in the air. But I always had basic physics questions, you know, like, you know, you take a rock, you smash it against another rock, you get smaller rocks. You keep doing that, do you just keep getting smaller rocks? Or eventually, do you get to, like, the smallest possible rock? Or does it turn into something else? So these are the questions I would ask as a kid. And so I never really got answers to those questions. I'm still trying to figure them out, you know? Science is, like, just a group of people trying to answer their own personal weird questions about the universe or nature or whatever. And this is my personal weird question is... I want to understand things from the very, very smallest bits. Do you believe it's turtles all the way down? <laughs> I would love if it was turtles, man. I want it to be something totally weird and mind blowing. Yeah. I would hate if like some theorist came out there with some idea for how the universe worked. And then we found out, yeah, that's true. I want to discover yeah. something strange. You know, I want to be like, actually, it is turtles. Oh, my God. Look at these little weird turtles waving up at us from the, you know, the Planck scale or something. Um, that, so that was a joke, but no, I think that there probably is a smallest thing. I think that there is an answer to this question. It doesn't just go on forever to smaller and smaller and smaller bits. I think there probably is a nugget, a basic building block of the universe that reveals like something deep about how the whole universe is put together. You know, I want like that level of answer, like the constructor of the simulation, what pieces did he or she use? I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, steal that uh as a now forever interview question what is your own <laughs> personal weird question that you're trying to answer in your field that's yeah. that's like that's fantastic i like that uh take i'm using i'm stealing it 
but I'm going to use it uh, in good, good faith. Do you think there's a something? I think there's a something because, you know, we take the stuff that's around us. I and you, we're all made out of um, atoms and molecules. You break those open inside of those. you got protons and neutrons. You break those up. you got quarks and electrons. And that's sort of like our current state of understanding, the most basic building blocks. But we know that it's not it. We know that that's not the final answer. Uh, first, because they're like weird patterns among all these building blocks that have no explanation, that like, are really strong hints that they're probably just made out of smaller bits. You know, like like you look at the periodic table, and there are patterns in it, right? And before you knew that the periodic table was made of smaller pieces, you'd wonder, like, how come these guys are all metallic and these guys are, you know, are inactive and whatever? And you wonder, what are all these patterns? And of course, now those patterns are just huge clues that tell you, oh, it comes from the structure of the atom, how they're put together. Well, we have the periodic table of the fundamental particles, six quarks, six leptons, and we see patterns in them, similar kinds of patterns, not the same ones, but in spirit the same. And we wonder, like, why are there, for example, three kinds of quarks? Yeah. Why, you know, why do the quarks and the, elept and the leptons balance each other electrically when there's no relationship between them? Um, I could go on and on about all the weird things we see in these particles that tell us there must be something underneath that explains it all, something akin to how the atom is put together. That's a simpler puzzle piece. So there's something that this uh, also puzzles me, and it's it's uh, within all of this. There's always a, a point where I get to and trying to understand it. And then there's, there's a feeling that things are not consistent with time. There's not a persistence of things in a place going and traveling. Like we would picture yeah. a thing moving in space. There's inconsistencies where things are when it comes to our experiential perspective of time. How does time yeah. play into trying to find a, a thing? It's a great question because we try to understand the microscopic world and we try to do it in terms of the things we know, right? So I say particle, you probably think tiny little spinning ball, right? Because mm -hmm. you can only think about it in terms of things you know. It's like you drink, you eat a new fruit for the first time. You're like, hmm, it's a little key mixed with a grapefruit or whatever, right? So when you encounter a quantum object, the electron, you're like, well, what is it most like? The problem is it's not like anything, right? It's like, a little bit like a particle, it's a little bit like a wave, it's mostly like nothing we've ever seen before. And one of the ways it's weird, as you say, is with time. Like for example, particles at the quantum level, they don't go, they don't move, right? It's not like they have a path where like you were here and you were going in this direction, so now you're here. You know, if you throw a ball, you say, well, the ball started here and it ended here, therefore it was at every place in between, right? Right. Particles don't do that. They don't go. They don't smoothly move from one place to the other. They have snapshots. They're like, I'm here. I'm there. That doesn't mean I was in between. You could have like an impenetrable barrier in between. No big deal. I don't have to be in between my locations. So like, yeah, it's mind bending. Blair, you look very upset at this whole concept. <laughs> it's a lot. I mean... <laughs> Learning this, these kind of concepts in school, you kind of accept there's something that the teacher's not telling you. Like, okay, they're dumbing it down for me, but they, they know really what's going on. <laughs> but they don't. Actually, they don't. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's my favorite part is that, uh, you know, random people who ask questions about this have the same questions that we do, right? Like all these questions, what is the smallest piece? How did the universe begin? Those are the same questions that animate scientists today. Like we would love to know the answer to those questions. And uh, and that's why I, I like to tell people that, you know, everybody's individual weird questions is what pushes human knowledge forward? Because people are just like, no, I must understand. We'll keep digging in the knowledge mines until I figure this thing out, you know? And so far, yeah, yeah. we don't know. I kind of like that analogy the, uh, of like the magician being asked to reveal how they do the trick and just going, no, I really don't know. I'm I just really amazed know. everyone out there that that worked every time. But it wasn't in my hand and then it was in my hand. I was, yeah. I was like, the first exactly. time I did it, I freaked out too. But now, yeah, I, just, I used it at parties as a trick. And it's both like frustrating because you'd like to understand it intuitively, but it's also awesome because it's sort of the whole idea. Like we want to pull back a layer of reality and figure out how things really work. It'd be kind of boring if things were just like smaller and smaller, tiny physical balls all the way down. It's much more fascinating to pull back a layer of reality and be like, what? 
we okay. thought it worked like this way. That's totally wrong. It's completely different. You have to revolutionize your whole relationship with like the universe. You know, that's mm -hmm. those are the moments in science I'm around for, right? When you figure something, when you see something, you're like, this blows up everything. Like that's what I want. <laughs> that's my personal scientific fantasy is to discover that it actually are tiny little turtles or boomerangs or strings or whatever and make people go, huh? How can that be? How, how did that happen? Yeah. So you, with the experimental high energy physics, you take these tiny knot balls of things or and shoot them at each other mm -hmm. and see what happens. Mm -hmm. um, working at the Large Hadron Collider with the Atlas experiment, I mean, you're that. This is where the Higgs boson was confirmed, mm -hmm. which was a major, major pillar of the standard model of physics theorized for ever but then 50 years yeah yep. experimental physics finally gave the evidence that it's that that our standard standard models right that boson was there what has been happening recently at the atlas what is <laughs> like have we gotten anything that's kind of tantalizing as to you know the tantalizing weird turtle or is everything still kind of like this is we're, we're fine we are confirming everything what what's going on uh well we have not seen anything weird yet Right, we have seen everything we expected to see, including the Higgs boson, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, but we haven't seen anything new, and you know you have to remember that this is exploration. Sometimes mm -hmm. you get a good hint for like what you might see when you go land on that alien planet. Uh, sometimes you don't, and so we thought the Higgs boson would be there. We found it. It's that's cool, and then we had various ideas for what else we might see when we collided these particles. Because remember, colliding particles gives you like a window into the basic universe. What happens when you smash the proton and, and, and the other proton together is you make this little ball of energy. And then nature gets to decide what to make out of that. It's not like um, chemistry where you rearrange the bits of the proton into something new, but you're stuck using the original bits. It's alchemy. You like, it turns into energy and then you can make anything. You don't even have to know <laughs> that it's possible. You just, you just have enough energy and you can make it. So it, it's really like anything on nature's menu. And that's why we try to crank as much energy as possible. So every time you get like a new piece of energy, a new le level of energy where nobody's looked before, it's really akin to like landing on an alien planet for the first time and exploring. You don't know if you're going to be met with a parade or there's going to be pink elephants or it's just like dust and rubble, right? But that's why we explore because we hope to find something weird and new. So that's a long way to say we ain't found nothing yet, um, but it's exploration. So we never know what's around the corner. And, you know, we didn't know when we build it, if there were exciting discoveries waiting for us or nothing. Yeah. And so the power that the Collider and the Atlas experiment are working at now, is the experiment not just, I know, not just with COVID, but is it shut down currently for renovation, not renovation, improvements? Upgrades, strength, we call them. Upgrades, yes. yes. Yeah. yeah, we run for about 18 months and then, you know, things break down and we have ideas for how to improve them. And then we turn it off and we warm everything up, which takes a few months. And then we go down there and we replace stuff and we upgrade stuff, we improve it. And then usually also they tweak the collider itself to make it a little higher energy or higher rate, like more collisions per second. Mm. Because if you're looking for something really rare, like something that happens at once every trillion or quadrillion collisions, then you want as many trillion and quadrillion collisions as you can get. And so right now we're in the middle of a shutdown and we were supposed to finish that shutdown late this year, but of course that's been delayed uh, due to COVID because people can't go in and work on stuff. Um, yeah. until sometime next year. But, you know, there's still a lot of stuff we're hoping to see and a lot of the stuff that we haven't even really looked at yet. Like, we get so much data, petabytes and petabytes of data when this thing is running. It takes years to comb through it. There could be a crazy particle discovery like sitting in the data right now on this laptop that blows our minds and revolutionizes physics. We just haven't yet gotten around to looking at everything. Yeah, I saw something recently about a subatomic particle that had something like a three sigma significance that's coming out of the Large Hadron Collider. And the, you know, it's like, okay, well, it's it's so funny. I look press releases and I'm like, only three sigma. That's not worth reporting <laughs> exactly. on. No, <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm not talking yeah. about it until it hits five. <laughs> yeah. And there's a reason for that, right? Three sigma means it's unlikely to be a random fluctuation, but you know, how unlikely? It's like one in 10,000 or so. And we do a lot of looking all the time. So if you, you know, flip a coin, if you roll a die 10,000 times or you get 10,000 monkeys in a room, like you're pretty likely to get something close to Hamlet every day. And so we got to see something really weird and really big because we're looking in so many places all the time. And even still, we haven't looked everywhere. You know, there's a bit of like, I don't know, theoretical blinders on the community, in my opinion. Like the theorists have ideas for what we should see. And right. most experimentalists are going to look for those ideas and leaving lots of the territory just unexplored. And uh, so I think that a lot of the stuff that we could discover, no, just nobody's looking for it because it's not cool right now. And uh, uh, you know, so the theory, if the theorists aren't publishing the papers on it, that's not where the experimentalists are going. There's no papers. So why yeah. should I dig in this other area? I'm not a theorist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I think experimentalists should be explorers. I think we don't need to know that it's going to be there to find it. We just need to go sail out into the ocean and run into some crazy new continent, right? A land, land on a weird planet. We don't need to know it was there to find it. Um, and so, but we've gotten into a, like, big science and you you know devote a lot of resources and so it has to be approved and whatever i even had the experience where i wanted to look for something in our data and they said no because there's no theory paper about it so then i went and found some theorists and wrote a paper with some theorists about yeah. it all right now can i look in our data and they said yeah yeah now you can look in the data so That's and then it wasn't there but you know but at so least you got when, to look yeah <laughs> exactly when people talk about space exploration it's not that i don't like space exploration i think it's fascinating but i also sometimes i'm compelled to say but what but what about exploring our own planet because like there's <laughs> parts of the ocean we don't know very well now i'm gonna have two i'm gonna want to say we need to explore our own planet we also need to like explore our own matter more closely <laughs> yeah yeah, but it shouldn't be an or, right? Like right, of each of we these things, all. we of want all of them. They're not yeah. zero sum games, you know? Yeah. And it goes back to what you were saying earlier um, about like, these things are not expensive. We have all these opportunities in science where we could literally just buy knowledge. You know, like you give scientists a hundred million bucks, they tell you the answer to this important question. Like, wow, why are we not doing that all the time? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, give I, the I did, scientists the money. Yes, mm -hmm. just give them the money and learn amazing things about the universe. It should be like bipartisan. Everybody should be in favor of learning awesome things about the universe. Mm -hmm. Great technological spinoffs. Awesome economical feedback, uh, economics um, revitalization. I, I don't get why it's not more popular. Right. So from Blair's analogy and what you've just brought up, the uh, the space program has brought us all sorts of technologies that have made it to consumer level where it has impacted society from the levels of research and government and policy all the way down to, you know, spam and Velcro <laughs> on your shoes. Right. Um, you know, so these these advancements are affecting us and that I'm sure from the technological advancements that are necessary for high energy physics, you're, I mean, the Large Hadron Collider is one of the most advanced, if not the most advanced device on the, on the face of the earth. And it, I mean, there's also, what, what is it? Uh, LIGO and Virgo, um, you know, the gravitational wave detectors, but to be able to do these things, yeah. technologies have to be created. Advancements needed to be made. And those will, those will end up making an impact. Yeah, and you never know. Is it going to be next year, in 10 years, in 15 years? You never know. But basic research has always paid off. You know, in the long term, it's always a good investment. Um, and, it, but and it also it, sounds, it sounds like the, the data you, you've been collecting, too, it's not like, oh, we, we did all these experiments and we didn't find anything interesting, so we're going to move on. That data is still there to be mined for the next 20, okay. 30, 40, 50 years. And I love the description of it's just because nobody's written a paper on it. People can now write papers and and go test it against yeah. some already done observations, which has yeah. not been something that's uh, been possible before. I mean, how long was it uh, where the 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 uh, Higgs uh, boson was was uh, found on paper until it was actually observed in nature? We were talking like what fifty years, seventy years, something years. like this. Yeah, that's 50 different. years. So so now we have we have now we have the observations outpacing perhaps some of the theoretical, mm -hmm. which is that's kind of a fun thing, because now there's there's already a way to, mm -hmm. to sort of 
uh, test your hypotheses, mm -hmm. test your yeah. findings on. And you want to be, you want it to be is that if somebody has a great idea in five years, you can go back and say, oh, well, maybe we have evidence for that in our data that we took. So absolutely, we're not just like checking the data and then throwing it away. We're keeping it and we come back and we look at it all the time uh, because people have new ideas. Like just uh, last, last month, we had a new idea for like how to look for dark matter in the mm -hmm. collider. Like maybe we could be producing dark matter in these collisions and study it in this cool way. And so we're always coming up with new ideas for how to use these, these collisions because they're very general, how to use them to answer really interesting questions about the universe. Have you created an app to uh, create dark matter or search for dark matter yet? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't figured that one out yet, no. Um, nobody knows how to see dark matter. It's frustrating because, you know, and dark matter is like all around us. We're like swimming in dark matter. Right, fact, Gigi wants a Snapchat filter for the dark matter. <laughs> I do. Oh, oh man. Dark matter, dark matter be, over there. That would be Nobel Prize right there. Right? You know, if you could see the dark matter, like that's, it's one of the biggest open questions in modern science, if you ask me, is like, what is this stuff? We know it's all around us. In fact, we're probably moving through a wind of it because the earth moves around the sun, right? And so probably there's a dark matter wind in your face right now um, that you just can't feel. <laughs> or here. <laughs> or here. <laughs> no. Yeah, but exactly. Tell us about the. I I love the uh, the idea that you that you came up with for the cosmic ray detection with cell phones. How does how does that work? Why does it work? Yeah, that's that's a fun project. Um, well, we are the Earth is being hit by cosmic rays all the time. Cosmic rays are just particles from space. So like a proton, super high energy, hits the Earth's atmosphere. Think of it like a tiny little asteroid, right? Big one that killed the dinosaurs, tiny little proton size um, um, meteor from space. And the cool thing about them is that we don't really know where they're coming from. And they have like ridiculously high energy, like much higher energy than anything we make here on Earth and higher energy than anything anybody thinks can make, can make these anywhere in the universe. Like you ask an astrophysicist, what's the highest energy particle in the universe? And they're like, all right, take a supernova, slingshot it around a black hole, do everything you can. They get to like within maybe a thousand of these, uh, um, a factor of a thousand of these particles. So we see particles hitting the earth and we don't understand what or who can be making these particles. And so it's a fascinating mystery. And one way to study them is, is to just to, to look at this, these big showers they make in the air. Particle hits the atmosphere and knocks into other particles, leaves these big showers. And the problem is that we just haven't seen enough of them. So we have really big detectors, one in Utah and one in South America, that are like 3,000 square meters to try to capture one of these showers. But they're rare enough that you just haven't seen enough of them. And so I thought, well, wouldn't it be cool to be able to like build an Earth-sized telescope to capture all of the ones that hit the Earth? And uh, yeah. because that would cost a gazillion dollars. So we thought, well, can we do it using already existing technology? And so there is a piece in your phone, which is just the camera. And the camera is basically just a little particle detector, right? Like there's a piece over it where the photon gets turned into electrons. And then it uses a little piece of silicon and it stirps those electrons out of the silicon. And that's a particle detector. We use the same technology at the Large Hadron Collider to look for particles. So we wrote an app, which when your phone um, at night, when your phone is like camera down, it turns on the camera. And if it sees a little blip in the video, it says, oh, that was probably a particle. And if a bunch of phones nearby all see blips at the same time, that was probably a big shower of these particles. And if you get enough of them, you can like point back and say, oh, this is a big shower that came from over there in space. And so we had this fun idea one time, like over coffee, and we're like, hey, that'd be silly. Huh, wait, maybe that's not so silly. I wonder if we could actually do that. And so then we wrote the app and we got it running and we did some calculations to see like how many phones would you need to like actually do science with this? And it turns out you need something on the order of like five to 10 million people to run the app in order to like build a worldwide telescope that can do science at the level of like these hundred million dollar facilities. So I thought, well, that's a lot of phones, but it's a tiny fraction of the phones out there, right? There's yeah. like millions of phones. There's, Five million phones turned on every single day. So for sure. 
sneak it into the next you know google release or whatever and we'd be set <laughs> um, so that was the idea and we wrote the app and uh, now we are working to make it like more robust um not drain your battery be high performance we've put some phones into particle beams to test their performance so we're gearing up to have a big wide release when it's like really ready what kind of is is it just uh, uh, the same it's 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 not is it not enough of a blip to register as a photon that the camera would recognize like what is the difference in the signal from the cosmic ray blip from the normal photon that it detects it doesn't look any different right and like every yeah. time you take a picture there are cosmic rays in that photograph they're just like noise in your pictures so if you put like black tape over the over the camera then the photons can't penetrate anymore and, if, and then all cosmic you can rays see, can cosmic rays still can exactly muons and high energy electrons and all sorts of crazy stuff yeah exactly and uh, and we've seen some of these like we we um if you go higher up in the atmosphere there's more radiation from space because there's less of a buffer protecting you and so if you're on a plane and you run the app you see all these streaks from particles yeah i know um air traffic air travel is dangerous for for other reasons right not just covid <laughs> i i think i'm cosmic rays regardless this is just not high on my list for concerns no. just nope so are you not are you not supposed to use this app then when you're on a plane no you totally can yeah totally can the, okay. the phone knows your altitude and so it's it's very valuable data yeah very yeah. cool all right i'm gonna take i've got a flight coming up i'll uh <laughs> i'll lock it in yeah, so that's yeah. been a fun, a fun project. But that's just sort of like a side thing. Like, let's see if we can do this crazy piece of science uh, for basically no money um, as a fun as a fun side project. Yeah, what's the name of the app? So uh, it's, called, it. it's called Crayfish Cosmic Rays Found in Smartphones. So Crayfish, and uh, you can find our website crayfish.io or just Google for it. And uh, you know, we wrote a paper, and we're not members of the cosmic ray physics community. And so we wrote this paper and put it out there and they were just kind of like, what are you people doing? Um, it was <laughs> and you're like, why not? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hey, I don't know. Um, Let's half try the community it. was like, that's a cool idea. The other half were like, you're crazy. That'll never work. Um, so it was a lot of fun sort of sociologically, you know, to enter into a subfield, adjacent subfield of science where you're not established. Yeah. And try and get traction of some kind. But yeah. yeah. It really yeah. brings out really brings out the different personalities of people, I would imagine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And you do so much though. I mean, you've got your research focused, your uh your your you've got this kind of a project where you're kind of coming up with neat technologies and neat ways to look at different questions. But then you've also got science communication. You've been working with Jorge Cham for years now doing comics and a couple of books mm -hmm. is it two mm -hmm. books now and you'll also have a pbs program coming out and you have your yeah. podcast yeah how did you get so involved in in communicating science and like it, you trip over jorge one day what happened <laughs> um no i i just always wanted to share the stuff i think it's really fun i think everybody i think this kind of wonder belongs to everybody you know like what is everything made out of and how did it start and everybody wants to know the answer to that question like I sit on an airplane and somebody's like, hey, what do you do? I say, oh, I'm a physicist. They're like, Bleh, I hated physics in high school, right? standard. <laughs> and then I say, all right, I'm just trying to figure out where how the universe started. And they're like, oh, really? how did the universe start? You know, And then you connect to their questions because everybody wants to know these questions. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought uh, it was like back in 2008, I was an assistant professor. And I was thinking, what's a better way to communicate this stuff than just like talking about it? And so I thought using comics and cartoons might be like accessible because comics are, you know, they um, they take down your defenses. They tell you like, hey, I'm not fancy. This isn't serious. We're just talking about fun stuff. Um, but I don't have any artistic skill myself. And um, I was a huge fan of Jorge, of course. Everybody in academia knows Jorge is like a celebrity. He's, you know, group. He's a group therapy us all through through grad school. And uh, so yeah. my wife, who's also an academic, she's like, oh, why don't you just email Jorge Cham and ask him to do it? And I was like, you can't just email a celebrity and ask them to do a project with you. Like, what am I going to email Brad Pitt and be like, hey, be in my movie? Um, <laughs> Actually, it works. That's how. <laughs> yeah. 
That's how that works. <laughs> exactly. It is how it works. He's been so sitting just, around. People are so afraid of approaching him. He hasn't worked yeah. in a long time. Nobody <laughs> called. He's just like, I'll do anything. But nobody's yeah, emailed or called me. I'll just stay home and watch Netflix. Yeah. So I emailed him, just cold emailed him and said, hey, I have this fun project. Would you would like to collaborate? And he was like, hey, that sounds cool. And so then we got started and then we just had fun. And so we did a bunch of videos and a few of them went viral. Like we put out a video about the Higgs boson just before it was discovered and um, it went all over the internet and that was really fun. And then uh, we wrote a book called We Have No Idea, all about like the big unanswered questions of the universe. Um, and that was a lot of fun. And for me, like, you know, I may, I'm mostly trying to be a research scientist and teach i'm doing that whole professor thing and all of these things are like fun side adventures like sure i never wrote a book before what's that like let's try it i don't know who you know, for me like if any of these things if i embarrass myself or fall flat on my face like i can just go back to being a physicist um so it's like sort of like low risk and i have like huge respect for people who like leave their day job and dive into it and do these things full time because that's you know you're really taking a chance on yourself i was never that brave um, so we we wrote that book. <laughs> yeah, congrats. <laughs> I'm just gonna um, wave. <laughs> like, <yeah. "Hi." laughs> and um yeah. and so we've just been having a lot of fun working together ever since. Um and a couple of That's years great. ago, PBS reached out to Jorge and said, Hey, have you ever thought about doing a science show for kids? And he called me up. He said, What do you think? Should we try to do a science show? And I said, I don't know, let's try it. So hmm. we um we put together a pitch for a show and it's all about a bunch of little curious animals that wonder about the world and then figure out the answers themselves. They don't like go ask parents. They're like, hmm, how do we think about this? Or how could we figure this out? And they use very simple basic science practices. It's for like five-year-olds to get them to think like, you know, have a scientific mindset and to encourage their curiosity. And we sent it in and, you know, like with grant proposals, you send it in, you expect to never hear back. But then they called us up, they're like, okay, make this show and we were like what i'm googling like how to make tv show <laughs> um, <laughs> like i wish that was a joke but um yeah, how do i yeah, do this yeah. we figured it out and it's coming out yeah. on pbs next month it's called nice. eleanor wonders why and it's on pbs kids and it's all about wonder and curiosity and the joy of discovery and figuring your and figuring stuff out um and I it's think... been a crazy experience but a lot of fun I think that's such a skill that I I hope that we can teach to younger generations the figuring stuff out that curiosity yeah. and you know it's not always in a book like we were talking yeah. about at the beginning the teacher the magician doesn't always mm -hmm. know the answer and you know but there's still that that process of figuring things out and all of us can do that I hope you have at least one episode of these little animals um figuring out that the earth is round <laughs> and going through that process of confirm of confirmation <laughs> debunking conspiracy theories on there we go <laughs> uh, yeah the curriculum for the show is actually more life sciences which is funny okay. uh, it's not physics but it's you know it's for five-year-olds so it's basic stuff it's like is a rock alive or not you know why do birds have feathers uh, mm. And the research I did is like I walked around my neighborhood, which has lots of kids, and I was like, hey, kids, what questions do you have? And, you know, they told me about stuff like that. You know, they're like, did you know cats can have babies? Oh, my God. And, you know, these little moments were like your mind is blown as a five year old when you discover something like that. That's what we tried to capture. I feel like all the questions I get from kids, because I work at a zoo, is uh, who would win, a shark or a tiger? <laughs> and you're like, are there lasers on the shark? Because. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, actually, they would never actually encounter one another in the wild. So it's, it's really, there's a problem with the premise of your question. <laughs> but isn't there a shark that eats polar bears? I've heard that before. Oh. I'm sure, oh. given an opportunity, a shark would try to take a bite out of a polar bear. But a polar uh, bear, depending I feel like, on the would species. also try to eat a shark. So. I do. I do think that. <laughs> I as well. like an orca. I think an orca must have, at some point, encountered a polar bear and made it uh, turned it into lunch. I feel like that has to have happened. Oh, I it is shark. It is shark orca. week right now. So, you know, we, we're probably feeding sensationalist material into the ears and eyes <laughs> of the producers right now. Yes. 
Uh, someone in the chat room was wondering, and I think you mentioned this, this kind of at the beginning, but someone in the chat room was wondering um, what your... Uh, what you think the biggest or most interesting mystery of the universe is? Uh, to me, the biggest mystery of the universe is what happened before the Big Bang. You know, like we can dial back the clock towards zero. We don't even really know what T equals zero is because we're pretty sure that the rules of physics change as you get that, that hot and that dense. So, you know, we can say like, oh, the universe is expanding or is... And we can run the clock backwards, you know, to crazy density, but we don't even really know what that is. And we have no idea what happened before that. Like, was there some other weird kind of matter which gave birth to our universe? Was there a whole other universe just like ours that crunched and then created another Big Bang? Like, it's bonkers to me that we don't know the answer to this question. Like, in a thousand years, um, I hope, humans will know the answer to this question. And they'll look back at us and be like, what was it like? to live back when they were so ignorant, you know, when they didn't know this very basic thing about their own universe. The way we think about cavemen and cave women, like not understanding what stars are, right? The whole context of their life. We're just as ignorant. And so to me, that's one of the most fundamental questions because it changes your whole relationship with the universe. Like if you knew exactly how the universe started, that could change how you live your life, right? That has real philosophical meaning. And so, that's the kind of question I want the answer to. That's like, if I could speak to the Oracle, that's the question I would ask. <laughs> yeah. I, sometimes, you know, there are those big perspective changing questions where it's, you know, how is this research actually going to affect my life? How is it going to change things on a day to day basis? But, you know, sometimes it's putting things in perspective in a way that mm -hmm. it does change things. Mm -hmm. And of course, we don't like answer those questions every day in particle physics. It's not like every day, mind blowing discovery, you know, mostly it's emails and, you know, this isn't working. Why does this code not compile? But occasionally, occasionally you get those moments. Janet, you left the coffee on again. Exactly. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, All exactly. Right. So we have a whole bunch of show left. I am enjoying this conversation so much, but um, I hope that you will want to continue to converse with us about the science. Yeah, I'm happy to stick around and chat with you guys. It's a lot of fun. Awesome. In the meantime, where can people find you online if they want to do some Googling and other things? Uh, well, you can find our podcast basically everywhere podcasts are cast. Uh, Daniel and Jorge Explain the Universe. Um, and there's danielandjorge.com. Uh, you can find our TV show, pbskids.com slash Eleanor for Eleanor Wonders Why. Um, I'm on Twitter at Daniel Whiteson. So, uh, or just Google me. You can find me pretty much. There aren't that many Daniel Whitesons in the world. <laughs> People will be able to find you. I think it's great. Okay, everyone. This is This Week in Science that you're listening to. Thank you for listening to Twist. We are so glad that you are a part of the show and that you are here with us this week. You are the reason that we're able to do what we do every week, bringing you up to date and down-to-earth views on science, discoveries that happen, and hopefully together we can help bring a sane perspective to a world full of misinformation. It's pretty crazy right now, I gotta say. Head over to twist.org right now. Click on the Patreon link and, 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 and choose your level of support. That's right. Be a part of bringing sanity and science to more people. If you choose $10 and up, we will be able to thank you by name at the end of the show. All right. We are coming back. Uh, this is Twist. We're back, and it's time for our COVID update. Beep, 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 be
a hoax. (laughs) (laughs) So I don't use it. I just brush my teeth and floss every day. Every single day. Well, according to a new study, researchers in Germany looked at four different kinds of mouthwashes that are found in pharmacies and also in uh, in stores that you can get over the counter. And they determined that um, while it doesn't completely stop your SARS-CoV-2 infection, it could potentially make it harder for you to transmit because it mouthwash kills SARS-CoV-2. So kind of like sanitizing your counters occasionally. Maybe it's if you have an infection or a reason to think that you're infected with COVID and you're going to be going to the dentist, maybe doing a little swish swish of the mouthwash could help reduce the possibility of you transmitting to other people. Mouthwash. Who knew? So the part of the problem my dentist has with mouthwash is that it, it's uh, it's kind of a broad brush. So yes. you could potentially be killing beneficial bacteria in your mouth. Um, and so I think in this case, yes, if you think you have COVID, <laughs> mouthwash to your heart's content. But I think that was <laughs> that was where, you know, at least some of my kind of concerns about mouthwash as a general daily practice come from is that you maybe you need some bacteria in your mouth. <laughs> Absolutely, we need bacteria, some yeah. bacteria. Yes, so. yes, we do. But, you know, if if there are viral yeah. <laughs> tr- transmission issues, let's see what we can do mm-hmm. there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, get that virus. Um, and in the question of whether or not SARS-CoV-2 is aerosolized, whether it's transmitted by just hanging out in the air of a room where somebody breathed. Another study has come out, just published in Med Archive this week, which is a preprint server. So take this with a grain of salt because it has not yet been peer reviewed. However, it does fall in line with several other studies that have been done. Researchers looked in a hospital environment in the rooms of patients who had been admitted to the hospital for potential COVID-19 infection. They found viable virus in the air of these hospital rooms up to about 12 to 15 feet from the admitted patients. So this was also without intubation procedures. And the question in hospitals had been to date, when when people who work in hospitals are doing intubation procedures, often pulling the tubes out and the airflow issues will result in aerosols with virus in the air. And the question was, is that the only route or is somebody who's infected just breathing virus into the air? Uh, The samples from the patients matched a a nasal swab and also these samples that they collected from the, the room air. It all matched genetically indicating that, yes, inf- infectious aerosols do get into the air just by infected people breathing. So, Well, I know that a lot masks. of hospitals, when they have the facilities, have been putting COVID patients in um, isolated airflow rooms specifically. Yeah. So I know that a lot of healthcare workers have kind of assumed that this is true from the start, uh, but it's nice yeah. to see some actual science on that. Yeah, it's that, you know, the... Uh, parsimony, I guess, or the uh, the what is what is the phrase where you try you try and do the most careful thing <laughs> to start with, <laughs> as opposed to waiting for something bad to happen right. before you start doing something. Yeah, an um, abundance of caution. Yeah, an abundance yeah. of caution for sure. Yeah. Uh, so Blair, I want you to talk about the story you brought. Yes, now, I because saw. it follows. Follows on this as to, you know, we should be wearing masks when around other people, because if you're breathing stuff into the air. But what did your mask story? So I saw a a study that kind of concerned me um, because every morning I go for a run and I uh, have a gaiter, one of those kind of buffs around my neck. And that's so that I can run. And then if I see I'm going to pass within 30 feet of a person, I'll pull it up and I'll cover up and then I'll keep running and then I'll pull it back down when I'm far apart from everybody else. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I saw this study with a a headline, which always you have to be careful with these headlines say 
wearing a neck gaiter may be worse than no mask at all. No, <laughs> no, like, no. Okay. As Justin um, pulls his up over uh, his face. Uh, <laughs> what? <laughs> let, me, let me read this. Okay. So there was a recent study that was published evaluating all these different kinds of masks. Um, and the first thing that I will say is that this study was to find a method to evaluate masks. And so they found certain things about the mask they evaluated, but that really wasn't the focus of the study. The focus of the study was the efficacy of the process. What they found was that N95s were the best, of course. Um, so the, the methodology seems to be good there because that makes sense. Um, it's because there were no droplets at all that they found on the other side of this mask if someone was talking through the mask. And then when people wore neck gaiters, it was actually, the droplet count was higher than if they were wearing no covering at all. Huh. Um, so the theory is that it's because it's this thin, stretchy material, it actually is breaking apart droplets into even smaller pieces. Oh no. On <laughs> its way out of your mouth. <laughs> so that's not good. So this is why they say that it could be worse than wearing nothing at all. Um, but they only tested one kind of neck gaiter. They didn't look at all these other variables about them. And, you know, we've talked in the show abo about, before about using the candle test or like seeing if you can feel the wind from your from your mouth if you, if you try to blow through mm -hmm. it. And if it is really thin, as some neck gaiters are, then, um, you know, these things weren't meant to be masks. They were meant to be like hold your uh, hair back or be soak up sweat around your neck or any number, or cover your face from dust. Things that are not part of preventing the spread of a virus. So it depends on the specific gator. Use those tests to see what to use before you go out. And again, this is a preliminary study that actually wasn't even studying the masks themselves. They were studying the, the efficacy of the test so that then they could share this test so that people could use it all over the world to test their own masks. And so I really appreciate Kiki actually threw in um, kind of some of that information here in a, in a rebuttal story for reasons you shouldn't trash your neck gaiter. And so um, one of them was, yes, the study tested how masks, how masks are tested, not which one is best. So that's what I was talking about before. And also this was all tested with, with one person talking through the same mask over and over and over. So there's all sorts of untested variables there. And this is also just for talking. They didn't test for breathing. They didn't test for heavy breathing. They didn't test for singing. They didn't test for yelling, right? So there's podcasting. all these general- They're podcasting, podcasting. Yes. yeah. Um, there's all these different things that, that go into what makes an effective face covering. We so, also so don't I know still... if droplet number has anything to do with the risk of transmission, as we were just mm -hmm. talking about. So if it's aerosolized, then um, kind of all bets are off. <laughs> and then we need to be testing something else entirely instead of the amount of droplets that show up on the other so side of the mask. I'm still putting everything into context uh, to the first analogy you brought to the show uh, about wearing pants. Uh -huh. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. how would... How would this, this, uh, and, and you have to retell the analogy real quick and then oh, sure. explain how you think the gator would be right. uh, you, an example of that analogy. So it was, it was something I saw someone else publish on the internet. I did not make this up, but the idea <laughs> was if, if somebody walks up to you and pees on you, right? So if, if you, nobody's wearing you, pants, if neither of you are wearing pants, you get pee on you. Yeah. If, you are wearing pants and they pee on you, you get less pee on you. If they are wearing pants and you are not wearing pants, you are very, it's very unlikely you'll get pee on you. But if you are both wearing pants, it is almost impossible for you to end up with, to have pee on your leg, right? But so, if they're just wearing stockings. Yeah, or if, if they're everywhere. wearing underwear and no pants, or any of, or if they're wearing like a very loose fit um, sweat pant, perhaps, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just. I but yes, anyway, this is where before you wear your mask, test its efficacy, try the candle test, blow onto your hand, see if you feel anything. And for heaven's sake, don't use a mask with a one way filter in it because that does absolutely nothing to prevent you spreading the virus. <laughs> so uh, 
that's like you, you that's like pants with your fly down yes that would be like wearing pants with your fly down exactly yes so um yeah so the mask we'll thing, that context, still figuring out what's very perfect. understandable to me we're yeah <laughs> So <laughs> the bottom make line everything is, easier to understand for sure. Yes. <laughs> wear a mask, wear a mask, wear a mask, wear a mask. If you have multiple masks and you can maybe ditch the gator, perhaps do that or give your gator the candle or the, or the blow test to see if it's going to be an effective face shield, but wear a mask. I think what this underlines so... for me is just how little we understand about this virus still. <laughs> and how it transmits and it's like you know causing gazillions of dollars of economic damage and killing people and we still don't really understand this thing it's incredible i was just thinking about how not that long ago we were all going mm, don't wear a mask the medical professionals can wear a mask but we don't need to wear masks it's fine just mm -hmm. kind of stay far apart from everybody and now we're like oh that seems so silly wear a mask <laughs> <laughs> like, that well, was, that so was me Two we're learning more. I don't... We're learning. So it, yeah. It's also very interesting because I'm about to take uh, an 11 hour flight on Oh, Monday. boy. And there uh, it is required that you have a mask, but the mask that you have doesn't have uh, any requirements other than it is a face mask. It's designed to cover mm -hmm. your face, it's not a scarf, or you're not just putting a piece of cloth and holding it in the flight or something like this. There's a recommendation that you change your mask every three hours, I think it is, uh, on the flight. But it, oh. but that's not enforced. It's just recommended. Uh, so there's a kind of a loose thing about who's going to be or not going to be wearing pants on this flight. <laughs> uh, but I did, uh, I did uh, acquire some medical grade masks, uh, enough to where I can have one on at the airport, one when we start the flight, one in, in enough to change throughout uh, the flight and get a, another one for getting out of the airport again. So I've brought enough for for this journey uh, to be replacing them at a level that I don't think I would be replacing them casually. Um, Are you going to wear a mask while you're eating your dinner? Mm -hmm. So so that's what's really interesting. At first, uh, at the word I, I the rumor was that there was going to be no food, and then it turns out there is going to be a meal served. Um, However, mm. you're not allowed to bring food. And oh, I think the idea they is... They don't want you grazing. Yes. They don't want people like having the mask off and going, I'm eating. Here's one nut. I'm going to chew it for five minutes. Like They don't want that. <laughs> but there is going to be this period where I suppose they... I don't know if they'll do it in shifts of feeding people or they just run the cart down and it's like here's where none of this precaution mattered and we just all take our masks off. Uh air is coming in from the outside and we're mm -hmm. circulating I think they said every 3 minutes something crazy quick like this like they're pulling the air and which they've been doing on modern planes for a while to just prevent every 3 minutes COVID. they just like roll the some, windows down. I mean that's cool. <laughs> it's something like that. Yeah, the air is the air is take constantly <laughs> <laughs> it's constantly doing uh, an air exchange and replacing wow. all of the cabin air, which is, is something that's actually common in most modern airplanes. Uh, and they did it a long time ago just to prevent people all from worrying about getting colds uh, on a plane. Because back in the days, it used to be you get the same However, air over and using, over. However, using air from outside the plane, it's very dry. And so that leads to drying out of your mucous membranes, which does make that it easier for you coughing. to catch a cold. <laughs> or, people, so, or people start coughing no because, they're, because the air is so dry. Yeah, so this is a concern. Yeah. Uh, a but this, this is, I, oh, this is, uh, uh, me and my daughter did go out to a, a, a breakfast because they have tables now outside that are like 10 feet apart at this, her, her favorite breakfast place. So we, we took the risk. We went out. We did this it's distance. It's all outdoors. It's fine. Uh, and my, my seven year old busted me up because. We ordered the thing. I was cutting up pancakes and getting everything ready for her. And then she just reached over and grabbed all the bacon off my plate and went, ow, without touching <laughs> your food. And I started laughing, but I'd been eating. So I was, so I just ended up coughing intensely. <laughs> I'm like, <coughs> my eyes are on, she's eyes are bulging. She's like, they're going to kick us out. They're going to kick us out. And then she does it again. <laughs> and I'm just losing it. Tears coming down, coughing uncontrollably everybody who took the risk to go out even outside even with the 10 feet apart tables 
they're all staring. Like we're the family <laughs> they were all worried about would be there. <laughs> but yeah, the dry air could cause somebody to cough. You scared everybody back inside. Good job. Yeah. Good I, job. I, think, I think I actually might have done the public service. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Well, speaking that. about trying to understand the virus, there was a uh, a study out this week. I think every week a new study comes out where we find out a little tiny bit more that maybe will get us to the point of being able to control it or treat it. Uh, and this week, researchers out of Northwestern University, they were looking at the molecular structure of the spike protein in the virus. The spike protein is what allows the virus SARS-CoV-2 to infect, to bind to cells and infect them. They're using nanometer level sim simulations, so tiny, tiny measures of space, these little tiny things. And what they, when they were looking at it, they found a positively charged site. It's called the polybasic cleavage site. That's located only 10 nanometers away from the binding site on the spike protein that allows for the binding to the cells and the infection. And the positively charged site helps the spike protein bond more strongly. Mm. And so now, because they know that it's there, what they, they designed a negatively charged molecule to bind to that positively charged site, and it inhibited the virus from binding to host cells. So potentially, if they can create a negatively charged molecule that can be delivered to patients, people who have been infected, it could potentially limit the infection so that people don't get as infected. So they did not expect to find, the, the researchers say they had, they were not expecting to find electrostatic charges having an impact at this nanometer scale. They were just not expecting to find it. But there we go. Physics in action at the molecular level. So, so Daniel, uh, this, this nanometer scale, is, is this tiny in your, uh, <laughs> in your line of work? Or is that, is that still way uh, macro huge? Yeah. yeah, that's like a football field for me. You know, like I can't <laughs> right. even think about stuff that big. You know, it's just, and and honestly, one reason I got into particle physics is that it's sort of simpler. Like you just get two little particles banging into each other. You don't have this whole like big swarm of stuff you have to understand, and it's folding and flexing, and it's it's just so much simpler that way. That, that's how I see it. Um, but you know, my wife is that's a microbiologist things. here at UC oh. Irvine, and she also has been studying COVID. And she's working on, um, she takes samples from the wastewater treatment plant here in Orange mm, County. So basically wow. she's looking for it in sewage, um, yeah. which is quite fascinating, yeah. So she, And she, they've seen it. So they, they can monitor the sort of population level of, of the virus um, without like testing anybody individually. Right, because everybody who's infected ends up, the virus virus. Yeah. goes through and you flush some virus out. Yeah, you shed it into your stool, and then it yeah. goes down the pipes. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. It's, it's it's amazing how many new ways we're coming up with for studying this thing. It's it's a there's a, so much innovation happening. I I think it's fantastic. The Russians they say they're innovating, and that they right. have um, they have a vaccine that they are moving ahead with. Apparently, according to a press release, and Putin. Um, Apparently, the report, it, they've only tested it, their vaccine, on like 76 people so far. Really not that many people. And uh, But Putin says that his daughter, one of his daughters, has already gotten the vaccine. And they are going to move forward with giving it to people, most mm -hmm. likely a small uh, cohort uh, of individuals. Uh, but based on... That we have no data. We knew mm -hmm. that there was a clinical trial happening with this vaccine in Russia, but there they have been at the same stage as everyone else doing phase one trials. They have published no results, so right. we have no idea how efficacious or safe this vaccine phase one trial was, which is usually not to actually see if it is effective, but just to make sure it doesn't hurt people. Um, Putin says it's fine. Um, and so they're they're rushing right ahead. Russian. Mm. Uh, see what I did there. So, so Kiki, I have a question. What yes. stops somebody 
from just injecting a bunch of people with saline. <laughs> with saline? <laughs> just like, yeah, just like, you know, just giving them fluids and being like, I gave them a vaccine. <laughs> uh, I, I would hope ethics. Right, but, <laughs> but I'm saying since if you don't have data, yeah, yeah, well, like we don't. I, I mean, nobody knows exactly uh, except for the people who are in charge of these various efforts uh, what's actually happening. Um, the do you have some reason not to trust Vladimir Putin? I mean, I what mean, other I motives know. could he have? Possibly? I just still, I don't want to <laughs> sound naive, but I feel like in the current state of the world that we shouldn't be bid like trying to rush to find it in order to like bid so that we can make the most money. This should be, I found a vaccine. Here's the recipe. Everyone make it. You would think so, but there's going to be a lot of money to be made <sighs> by the company, the country that develops the first vaccine. And so the, com the company that is behind the Russian effort is called G Gamalaya. And they have developed other vaccines before. And the vaccine that this SARS-CoV-2 vaccine is based off of uh, is one that was being developed for MERS, uh, but they have never actually brought it out of clinical trials. Uh, the vaccine is a two-phase vaccine where they use adenovirus, which is a form of the com they cause these adenoviruses can cause a com the common cold. Um, they use the first shot is adenovirus. Uh, I think it's adenovirus 20 or 26. And then the second shot is adenovirus 5. These The reason they use different adenoviruses is that if your body decides that it's going to mount a re an immune response against adenovirus 20, then if you give the second booster shot of the adenovirus 20, then it won't work because your body will have an immune response to it. And so using a, a different strain, adenovirus 5, for that second booster shot can potentially allow for your body to mount a good response to SARS-CoV-2 and not necessarily against the adenoviruses, which are used being used as vectors to infect your cells, to deliver the spike protein, to make your body mount an immune response against SARS. It's complicated. This vaccine is similar to a vaccine being developed by the Chinese, uh, who are still in, I think, phase two trials. And uh, but to date, similar vaccines have so far been okay all the uh, results from the phase one trials of similar vaccines around the world, they've been okay. They haven't had a lot of negative responses. Kind of like, here, take a Tylenol and call me in the morning. You know, a little bit of fever, a little bit of achiness around the injection point. Um, so it's kind of a, a, a standard vaccine methodology. And so it could be fine. The vaccine could be great. And if they're rushing it forward... Maybe it'll be all right, but at the same time, they really have not done the safety trials to know whether there will be a portion of the population, which when you get into large numbers mm -hmm. of you know, a population size, that could be a significant portion of your population that could have a negative immunological response. They haven't done those tests yet. Well, so. and isn't the other side of these, of the, I guess it's the phase three trials that most of these vaccines are in now, isn't that also to see how long the uh, antibodies hang out? Like how long you are able mm -hmm. to fight off the virus? Because yeah. the, the, the current thought is it'd be about six months, right? So you would need a booster or something like that. But we yeah. need to figure that out because if, if it's only going to be six weeks, then by the time you you get everybody vaccinated, then it's too it's spreading again back to the people who you vaccinated six weeks ago. So you need yep. to know how long this thing is going to be effective before you do a full blown launch. Yeah, also Russian like vaccine. Oh, I was going to say Russian vaccine is good two years. <laughs> two years. <laughs> and it just seems that. like they can't possibly know what the small. Um, so the smaller side effects are, you know, like if you do a study with 5,000 people, you don't catch those, that one in 10,000 people's head explodes or whatever. And that's sort of important, <laughs> you know? Right. And, it, yeah. and in order for mm -hmm. us to get through this thing, 
we not only need to know what side effects are and how long it lasts and all this kind of stuff, but we need to project confidence in the process and and that we know what the side effects are because otherwise people won't want it, which is and a whole nother problem. That is a huge, that yeah. And the, the, the negative press or negative public response, if it were to go poorly in Russia, that, I mean, that it could affect so many people's choices as to whether or not they decide to get vaccinated when one is available where they live. I know. And mind bogglingly, we are already in a fragile moment in terms of like confidence in vaccines. I mean, not for the lack of any data supporting them or anything, but like just because of the, the way they've been projected and the craziness of the Internet. So you're totally right. We need to be very careful in safeguarding uh, our credibility as a scientific community. So thank you, Putin. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <For nothing>. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a they, Russian researcher the, says. Took, when, sorry. When they took the mercury out of the the uh, the vaccines, uh, autism rates actually uh, increased a bit higher in the subsequent years. <clears throat> so it turns out mercury prevents autism. There's, <laughs> there's no. There's no. <laughs> There's no getting around it. There's what was the other one that the the vaccines are going to be created to make people uh, less religious. So they're going to they're going to tell people who they want to, I suppose, be their followers not to do the thing that's going to allow them to continue to follow. Yeah, it bonkers. seems like there's a Darwinian just thing at play in some of this that. It's self-correcting at some point. At some point. Yeah. My favorite take on it comes from Saturday Morning Breakfast Cereal, that comic, mm -hmm. where they made the point that um, in science, there's a higher fraction of people with autism. And so that means that actually vaccines don't cause autism. Autism causes vaccines. <laughs> oh, <great>. Very good <laughs> thought process. Sense. Yes. Mm. Yeah. yeah uh, Russian researcher says... Uh, it's very easy to make a vaccine and very difficult to properly test it and show that it works. So oh, yeah. take that as we will. I'm glad he um, finished I've... with that part. Cause that, yeah, that first part. <laughs> okay. Well, it's a lot of confidence. <laughs> okay. Oh, I get it. Yeah. Now it's yeah, hard to see if it works. Okay. That makes it's more sense. It's hard to yeah. see if it works. Yes. Um, and as my cat is running around here, uh, making a bunch of noise at my feet, my last COVID story has to do with cat drugs. Could be that drugs for your cat that are being developed to treat uh, coronavirus infections in your cats could help your COVID-19. How could that work out? Well, hmm. one drug that's already in development called GC376, snappy name, disables an enzyme that some coronaviruses, including SARS-CoV-2, used to replicate. And when it's been used, uh, it it blocks other coronaviruses and can block SARS-CoV-2. We don't know if it'll work in people. It hasn't been approved yet by the FDA, but it's already in development for your cat. So you could just borrow your cat drugs. No. No. Uh, no. <laughs> Whoa, no, gee. no, no, I'm gee, kidding. That's... Do not do that. Uh, <laughs> The other is called GS441524, and it actually is a cousin of remdesivir, which is a drug we've talked about a lot. It's the first one to have been found to help people's recovery time, to help speed up the time to recovery. Uh, and so it's an antiviral and, you know, potentially could be useful. So your cat's. They get infected by coronaviruses. The coronavirus can lead to something called feline infectious peritonitis, which is awful for the cats. And so as a result, this has been under development and research for a long time and might just help us too. Say thanks to the kitty cats, Justin. <laughs> He'd never. Going to. He would never. He never would. If you just tuned in, this is This Week in Science. If you want to help twist out, why don't you leave us a positive review on your favorite podcast platform today? That would be super helpful. All right, Justin, positive news or mouse, uh, I mean, negative news or mouse brains? 
What are we talking uh, about? <laughs> negative news. So uh, I'm waiting actually for my computer to be able to load a word type document in the Google sphere to be able to tell you this story. Uh, but the premise is going to be like this. In 2019, uh, Denver voters uh, got to vote on some new public policy, which would ban uh, camping in any sort of public area. And so what, what that, of course, primarily affects is homeless people. Uh, so the police started doing a dismantling of homeless camps in all public areas and in areas near waterway, like rivers, because there, there were people living down by the river and underpasses and overpasses and uh, down alleys and everywhere. They would clear out any sort of tents and sort of lodgings that homeless people had built and get them out of there. Well, they didn't really, they just got them moving, basically, is what would happen. So there's a study. Uh, this was uh, two weeks ago, Colorado State uh, Patrol Troopers cleared out nearly 200 residents and from one homeless encampment uh, around the Colorado capital. Um, so the, there was a study that was done by the Bell Policy Center COVID-19 Eviction Defense uh, Project uh, came up with some of this data to sort of look at what happens to homeless people. Uh, I'm sorry, the study was in collaboration with the advocacy organization Denver Homeless Out Loud, uh, and they had published in the Journal of Social Distress and Homelessness. They looked at police interactions with homeless people in the state of Colorado and the effects that it had on folks since this policy had been created. And mostly it seems to be that it, people have been forced to go into hiding as homeless people, meaning they're still homeless. You got rid of their tent or their encampment or whatever it is, they're still homeless. They're still out there. They still exist. They have not been put into any sort of affordable housing programs or anything like this. So what those people do in order to get a night's sleep, because they report being bothered by the police so much that they may only get sleep in two hour increments before being told to move again. Uh, as they go to more and more rural or hidden places, and in those more rural, distant and hidden places, there's higher incidents of violence that take place when they're outside of the protection that they actually get from being within a city and having police who are preventing abuse of human to human contact, supposedly. Uh, what's interesting about this too is this is sort of in contrast, this, this policy was put into place before COVID. And currently there are 420,000 Coloradans at risk for eviction in the coming months. Uh, wow. These are many of whom may have voted for this tough love on the approach to homelessness are now themselves being confronted with the very real possibility of not having a place to live. Uh, this is where the, the uh, Bell Policy Center and the COVID-19 Eviction Defense Project looked at it and they were seeing that the, with the eviction moratorium that's been lifted, meaning evictions are allowed to proceed now, <clears throat> the curbed or reduced or ended uh, unemployment benefits, there's, uh, there's about 20% of our of the United States 110 million renters, if you can imagine that's about a third of us, don't own a home. 110 million, 20% uh, of that, so what is it? It's, it's an easy number. It's 22 million people nationwide are preparing to become homeless uh, by I think August. Which, oh, we're there. It is so August. Yeah, by the end of this month. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So, anyway. It's only that August? Was, uh, that's... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ten years into the beginning of 2020, it's only August. Yeah. It's only August. Yeah. So, that's like a fun story. Um, just about it. I think I've, I've read social science papers before that have talked about how mm. um, in the United States, people who are living paycheck to paycheck usually don't identify as poor or low income. Hmm. There's a kind of, there's a disconnect there where people think that they're middle class. Somehow we've all been kind of sold this idea that like, okay, if you're not like stealing bread for your family, you're middle class. But like, really, there's a huge number of people in this country living paycheck to paycheck. And when this huge disrupt happened and people's 
paycheck disappeared or changed drastically, suddenly we were put in kind of a bad situation. And you can see how people might not be uh, making decisions as voters for this low income or poor identity that they don't think they have. And now we're kind of seeing mm -hmm. the result of that. Yeah. Good thing there's an election coming. Mm. Yeah, but 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 I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I haven't seen an administration that took housing affordability seriously. Yeah. I, and I don't care, Democrat or Republican, yeah. any of that. I haven't seen Nobody. one that takes that as all I've seen is further commoditization so that as soon as that, that 110 million renters, I think it's probably it sounds like an underestimation. I think it's more. Yeah, than I think that's way low. But that's that's full population. So then, you know, that's like that's 110 million adults and then all their kids under it. So oh, sure. maybe it's yeah. maybe it's like half of the families. Right. Or 60 percent mm -hmm. of us. Maybe. Um, but the uh, but the idea that, you know, minimum wage, this paycheck to paycheck that lifts all of those boats uh, almost immediately translates into rent increases. So you've yeah. done really nothing to solve poverty at any level and any aspect when you do this. So anyway, I, housing is to me just like mind boggling that that is not, we wouldn't need all this talk. I'm just going to rant. I know we wouldn't need all this talk about free education. Free health. We could pay for education. I, everybody could afford healthcare. Uh, if, if housing wasn't mm -hmm. commoditized and every time we have an economic downturn, we see more and more single family homes get purchased uh, through Wall Street hedge funds and then rented back infinitum. To the American public, uh, they don't. They don't. You know. Oh well. They, this is the conversation. That, I'll stop. I'll stop. This is a different conversation. Uh, but yeah, wake up, people. You're all going to be homeless. So any policy oh, that you gosh. can do vote for right now that can help homeless people is for you at some point. Mm -hmm. well, I think American yeah. voters are aspirational. They, a lot of them mm -hmm. like to think of themselves as, oh, I'm going to be up there. I'm the next billionaire. Mm -hmm. I want to allow billionaires to happen so that I could be a billionaire. Mm -hmm. you know? Totally. As, Absolutely. as opposed to the other perspective, which is if I don't make it to becoming a billionaire, what if everything goes sideways and I can't support myself? You know, instead of thinking of the, you know, the the rescue boat, you know, the way to, you know, I could vote for better policies for housing equality. I can vote for better policies for managing camping. We can vote for better policies. You know, there. You mean there, we should have are, a backup yeah. plan that's not being a billionaire? Like, wow, yeah. that, that sounds wise. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> it's billionaire or bust for me, man. Yeah. What's your backup Hands plan? In the lottery. <laughs> Well, Actually, you know, my plan is I'm going to be a multi-billionaire. So my backup plan is to be a billionaire. Ah. Well, the wealth income uh, disparity in this country reminds me very much of that infographic I saw on the differences in black hole sizes, the spectrum of the black hole sizes, where there's some that are like, like all of the other black holes all put together don't amount to but a speck in that black hole. Is the difference between somebody who's a billionaire mm -hmm. and a working uh, class person who yeah are you saying jeff bezos is a super massive black hole on our economy he is yes. sucking in all the money <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah i would say so well that's the problem right at a certain limit we're just we're going totally off at a certain yeah. limit that money just yeah goes into a black hole it doesn't come back into the economy so it's just yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. A, a perfect example that's something like food stamps or any other sort of uh, social funds that you put out there for housing. A hundred percent of that money stays in the United States and mm -hmm. goes right back into the economy. Yeah. It gets spent immediately. It drives further economy. We, we any shouldn't tax think of it as spending. We should think of it as an investment. It's investment an investment in, in Americans. Right. Yeah. It yeah. absolutely is. Every dollar of taxes cuts that you give to a billionaire. <laughs> they put into Wall Street for stock investments, which is buying single family houses and renting them back to people and raising the prices because now they put a you know, property manager and something else in the middle. And that's making people more. Poor. That's how and we then need even to be, if you have a tent, it's no good anymore. A stalagmite. <sighs> Not and a stalactite. Why would you put up a tight? I like that. 
geologist meets economics. I yeah. Like it. There you go. Yeah. There you go. It's like yeah. trickle up we're, versus trickle down. Or we're going to have okay. a cave in pretty soon. Yeah. Let's move <laughs> away from the economy. And yeah, the, I mean, this conversation is so important to so many of us and uh, the current events of everything right now. But it's it's stuff that we need to think about. But let's dive back into the science fun. And Justin, you you had a mouse brain story. I, Can you so tell me I have about... a, I'll have to get back to it. I'll have to get back to it because I have an unstable computer. Uh, oh, I it saw keeps that. Okay. dropping uh, out of existence and needing reboots at the moment. Oh. So okay. uh, I have to go find refine the story, but I'll, I you... will, I'll have it uh, in a minute. Is your computer okay, then... running on go a ahead, mouse brain? Go. It's running on a mouse brain. Or for at the end, we can go. A simulation. A mouse brain simulation. I'll save it for next week. All right. Moving on to more science. I have some shrinking dwarfs. We were talking about the universe and the Milky Way-like thing 12 billion years ago. Well, curious thing about white dwarfs. White dwarfs are... Stars that as they gain mass, eventually, at some point, they implode and they turn into super uh, supernovas, type 1A supernovas. So white dwarfs are these really cool stars. And an interesting hypothesis that astronomers had for a very long time, there was this size trend that they observed a long time ago in white dwarfs, and they they thought, they're like, okay, well, maybe this backwards relationship happens that the more mass a white dwarf has, the smaller it actually gets. But they haven't had any data to support it until now. Uh, researchers used the uh, Apache Point Observatory in New Mexico and the European Space Agency's Gaia Space Observatory to look at a bunch of white dwarfs and to look at the luminance of these white dwarfs, basically measuring how bright they were. And so then they're like, OK, this is how bright you are. So this is pretty much how big you are. Um, but then mass, they wanted to know exactly how massive they were. And you can't get that from the light. So they looked also at gravitational redshift, how much light is shifted as it moves past the dwarf and as it gets stretched out into redder wavelengths, they could determine whether the dwarf was more massive or not. Okay, and so what they did indeed found, find is that as they looked at a bunch of White dwarfs, the measurements really matched the theoretical predictions. White dwarfs with about half the of our sun's mass were about 1.75 times wider, bigger than the Earth. And then those with more mass than the sun were about 0.75 times the width hmm. of the Earth. So as they became more massive, gained more mass, they got smaller and smaller and smaller. So what explains this? It's Some something sort of gassy threshold going on. Yeah, what they call it, uh, that the material electron gas becomes exotic and that uh, the electrons in the white dwarf are what they call a degenerate electron gas. And this is not a put down. It's actually a term. <laughs> The degenerate electron gas, the electrons in this gas, has to squeeze together. So it's the electrons pack closer and closer and closer together so that they have enough pressure to hold the star up so that the star doesn't just collapse under all that mass. So it's this very interesting relationship that occurs that the more massive the star becomes, the more packing occurs. And so it gets tighter and tighter and tighter and smaller and smaller and smaller until eventually there is a limit reached. And yes, this, the, the, the mass of the star collapses and then you have a supernova. But until that point comes, as white dwarfs gain weight, gain mass, they actually thin down. <laughs> That's not happening to me during the pandemic. 
No, <laughs> me neither. <laughs> white dwarfs are amazing. And I think there's something people don't often realize about them is that they are stars technically, but they're not glowing from fusion. It's not like there's, you know, fusion happening like in the center of our stars. They're just like big, hot leftover blobs of stuff that are gradually cooling. And eventually they'll just cool so, so far down that they'll become what they call black dwarfs. Hmm. but it takes longer than the current age of the universe. So we don't think there are any black dwarfs currently in the universe, but like there will be an age of the black dwarf when eventually these white dwarfs become black dwarfs. And that'll be probably, stuff. it'll be at some point when the universe has expanded so far that we wouldn't be able to see them anyway. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And you know, they won't be radiating as much because they'll be cooler. Wait, yeah. If there was one out there today, could we see it? <laughs> yeah great question probably not i mean if it's out there and it's not actually a black hole it would still be radiating but just in like really long wavelengths so i suppose you could see it in a radio but it'd probably be pretty faint so it's probably what you can do is set some limits on you know how many there could be otherwise we would have seen them but also theoretically we just don't expect them to exist yet because we're still in the early days of the universe wait a minute we're in the early days of the universe? <laughs> yeah, well, we don't know, right? Will the universe go on for another 10 billion years? Another 10 trillion years? Quadrillion years? I mean, we look back at, like, the beginning of the universe. We're like, oh, the first few hundred thousand years, like, you know, things were just getting warmed up. This mm -hmm. could still be warm up, right? Aliens or humans in a quadrillion years could look back and be like, oh, back then when the universe was still expanding and stuff was hot and dense, you know, we, we just don't know what the scales are. Here's a here's a weird personal question. Uh, when, when, <laughs> how, how long till how long till we can't see stars? Or at least with the naked eye, maybe at night. Like looking up. At, well, the planet won't be here, but for, we're on a different planet, but reasonably within the same region of our galaxy. Um, and we look well, out, which we won't be there because <laughs> I'm talking when we can't see the stars. How far? It just kind of goes dark from well, yeah. any couple any points. It's, it's awesome, but you're right, the sky is getting darker, right? Because the universe is expanding and the expansion is faster than the speed of light. So so stuff is falling off the edge of the observable universe, right? Things oh. are that we could see before, we can no longer see. But that's mostly happening between galaxies. And our galaxy is gravitationally strong enough to hold itself together, um, currently okay. at least. So most likely our galaxy will collapse eventually into our own supermassive black hole and we'll just be a big black hole and with a lot of other black holes scattered through the galaxy, through the universe. Um, so, so eventually, so we'll, I guess. So we'll see the stars at night from uh, the Milky Way. We'll still yes. get to see our yes. galaxy stars at night for a very, very long time. But then at yeah. some point, uh, gal other galaxies were going to start to drop off that visible horizon. And, mm -hmm. and those But I don't go. want to say goodbye to the Andromeda galaxy. <laughs> oh, no. It's going to say hi to you. <laughs> It's, it's coming, to, it's coming to say hi. Yeah. Gonna, it might stay. Yeah. In fact, uh, Andromeda, does Andromeda have a bigger, much, much bigger black hole at its center? Oh, yeah. So yeah. that might be keeping us around. Yeah, it might, it might bring one. us along. All yeah. right. Yeah, exactly. I have a brain story. And then, shocking. Justin, if, yeah, shocking. I'll skip uh, my story. I'll bring, it, I'll bring it next week. I'll bring it next okay, week. Okay, fantastic. We're, Researchers yeah. at Michigan State University found that even when people know that they are taking a placebo, the treatment is linked to a reduction in brain activity that's indicative of emotional stress. They got people to come into their study, and this is published in Nature Communications. They say the placebos, placebos are all about mind over matter. Non-deceptive placebos were born so that you could possibly use them in routine practice so that rather than prescribing a host of medications to help a patient, you can give them a placebo, tell them it can help them, and chances are, if they believe it will, then it will. The researchers wanted to test these non-deceptive placebos to find out if they actually helped people. In the experiment, they uh, they told people that this nasal spray, which was saline, was a placebo. 
that it had absolutely no active ingredients but would help reduce their negative feelings if they believed it would. And then they had a comparison, a control group that inhaled the same saline spray, but they were told that the spray would improve the clarity of the physiological readings that the researchers were recording. And then they uh, they recorded brain activity and found that the uh, the placebo, the, the non-deceptive one where people were like, okay, it's a placebo, fine, it's not going to do anything. It did basically the same thing <laughs> that the placebo for the people who were told it would be doing something did. It reduced emotional distress activity, electrical activity in the brain. So, I mean, there are a couple of questions here related to, you know, the correlation of, hey, you're looking at electrical activity in the brain. Is this really indicative of that emotional duress? And Mm. is that really what you're measuring? However, the, 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 the idea that you would have the same exact or very similar responses when you're told that something's not going to work. Mm-hmm. <laughs> As well, when you're okay. told that it will. That you're being is, lied to. You're, yeah, you're, I, yeah. I have two takes. I have two quick takes on it. One is that if I was being told, you're getting the placebo, this does not have the active ingredients. I'm like, yeah, right. You'd assume you're getting Yeah, this yeah. is like a double, triple blind kind of thing where <laughs> yeah. you tell everybody it's a placebo, but you're the only ones that know later and find out and see, then you see the difference. And the other thing is we know that there are uh, like super responders uh, to placebo. Mm-hmm. So there's there are there are uh, some individuals who, who heal <laughs> Uh, from a placebo or go uh, or find a really transformative thing, whether it's their energy or the whatever was affecting that absolutely respond as though the treatment has worked. Mm -hmm. Uh, So there is this, this, they might not have caught it in this study, but there's, there's this weird segment that they have to try to figure out how to identify because they can ruin a drug trial. If you get one of these people that has like, this this strange uh, sort of mental ability to go think that they're c- cured and healed, and then the body kind of reacts like it is. They can ruin a drug study <laughs> by by showing that the placebo worked as well as the actual drug for for some of these individuals. There was some there was some uh, study about uh, what is it? What was it? It was like a brain surgery or something. This guy, uh, but they didn't actually do the they didn't actually do the treatment he was in Mm -hmm. the placebo control group and then suddenly the guy who had been like pretty much bed bound was out skiing and running i remember we talked about that on the show yeah and he had never gotten the treatment and they they'd gone back and they found like yeah there's a certain segment of people who absolutely respond to this but what what i'm wondering is this is a nasal spray right yes so are we sure just having more moist nasal passages <laughs> makes you feel better yeah <laughs> yes, exactly. the discovery they're it's not talking connected, about right it's all connected Saline like nasal when, sprays when your stress. when your sinuses are messed up it kind of messes with your brain and everything you're you're all disoriented maybe maybe oh, actually this yeah. isn't a placebo maybe no. wetting no, no. your nasal passages is like good for you Hey, Dr. Justin, not is a real the... doctor. Nasal treatment reduces stress based on placebo technology derived from science. <laughs> that let's, let's package that. We'll put it up there with the, our face masks and the mugs. I don't know. Yeah. I'm just throwing it out there because your your nasal turbinates are supposed to stay moist. So if I. It's a, I mean, it's a great point, and it gets at, you know, is there a mechanism? There's something happening. What is the mechanism? Is it uh, from, is it, you know, from the brain going, I feel happy? Or is it, you know, is, is it that, oh, there's moisture in the sinuses for this particular study, and that leads to a response in the brain? And then, uh, Maybe. you know, yeah. What maybe is the it's pathway? Volunteering, volunteering to help science, taking <laughs> some time out. Of it. Maybe that's the maybe, thing. 
that's yeah. giving you a better you feel good. Uh, science. Yeah, makes you feel good. Yeah, I'm contributing to science right now. I'm part of this very important study. Oh yeah, I can already feel it. I can already feel that working. Oh, that's good <laughs> stuff. People should do this. People should volunteer their time and uh, energy to science. even if it's just downloading an app. Uh, so that you can track the, uh, the these high-powered pr uh, protons coming from space that we don't know where it came from. Like those, are, that's like an amazing scientific project you could be part of. What is the app yeah. again? I just, I, I, I still got it. How do you spell that app, Daniel? Uh, it's crayfish. It's like crayfish, but without the last H. Okay, crayfish. Crayfish. From from a, a research standpoint, though, being able to use something like a non-deceptive placebo to have the same effect as a placebo, but not the ethical conundrum that maybe a researcher would be under, um, mm -hmm. that knowing that a non-deceptive placebo can have the same or a similar effect may allow studies to take place that couldn't happen otherwise because mm -hmm. of you know potential uh, ethical issues uh, i mean yeah. to me it's it's rings a little bit just of like suspension of disbelief like you go in to see a movie you know it's fiction you know it's made up you know it's actors you can still get into it you still have reactions you jump out of your seat when the zombie comes out of the closet like yeah. there's a part of your body that has bought in even though you know you know as a fact that it's not true but you know you still participate emotionally so maybe there's part of that to happening and it could be the participation that is the key that maybe it's the act of mm. taking a pill the act mm. of using the nasal spray that part that participation like you said maybe that allows the some amount of buy-in yeah. whether or not it's deceptive yeah anyway placebos they're crazy we really don't understand them it's pretty awesome a very interesting effect that definitely needs to be taken into account this is this week in science and we have made it to that point in the show that so many people wait for. So, I know I do. <laughs> I know you do. It's time for Blair's Animal Corner. With Blair. With Blair. She loves our creatures, great and small. Biped, milliped, no pet at all. Want to hear about animals? She's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels. And a what you got, Blair? I have a story about tuataras. Do you know what a tuatara is, Justin? Uh, I, no, I got yeah, I got one of those when I was like nine years old. It had the joystick no, you, with the one no. big red button, and like came no. with the, the games weren't great, but it was like no, still the best thing you could Atari. get. No, that's an Atari. No, this is a Tuatara. Oh. Oh. It's it's a reptile. Um, it looks like a lizard. If anyone who was not a biologist or a zoologist saw this animal, they'd go, "That's a lizard." It's not a lizard. <laughs> not a lizard it's a rare reptile from new zealand and it is the only remaining member of sphenodontia so when we think about reptiles we have lizards we have snakes we have turtles we have crocodilians and we have tuataras they are their own thing hmm. and there's lots of debate about what they are more closely related to. Are they more closely related to birds and crocodiles, archosaurs? Are they more closely related to turtles? These, this like kind of question mark dotted line where we don't know exactly where they belong on the family tree. Or do they belong to a shared ancestor with lizards and snakes since they look so much like lizards? <laughs> and so this is uh, the first sequence of the Tuatara genome. And they have been able to uh, kind of draw some conclusions from there. So this was a global team of researchers. They partnered up with Maori tribes to sequence the Tuatara. And um, they found that they are in fact more closely related to lizards and snakes and that they diverged about 250 million years ago. And that is wow. a long period. Yeah, this is period. a tiny dinosaur. This mm -hmm. is a tiny living dinosaur. Yeah, oh my goodness. So, so these guys have been separate from lizards and snakes for so long that this might be why this genome, as far as they can tell, is super unusual. 
It has a lot of repetitive DNA segments that are unique to these guys and that have no known function yet. <sighs> yet. That's the key. Yet. They are predominantly nocturnal animals, but their DNA carries a high number of genes that are involved in color vision, which means they're doing something during the day. So their, their current theory is that it helps juveniles escape from predators. Here's the other crazy thing. Lizards live, I don't know, maybe if you're lucky, 20, maybe, maybe 30 years. Two Ataras can live to be over 100 years old. Wow. So let's study that. Yeah. So scientists examined some of the genes that appear to be used to protect the body from aging. They found that the Tuatara have more of these genes than any other vertebrate species they have yet sequenced. So they got something going on in their genes that helps them live so long. They also don't appear to get many diseases. So looking into the genetic factors there could be pretty helpful. Where uh, do they live? New Zealand. And that's okay. where we run into trouble. They aren't doing great. <laughs> and Jeez. it's because of rats. It's because of invasive rats. So this is an animal that is being protected. That's why the researchers worked with Maori tribes to, to study these guys safely and to, and to study their behavior as well safely. And so the more we can know about their genome and their biology, the better we can conserve them since we, we can understand what they need from us to succeed. They used to thrive in New Zealand, but then about 800 years ago, the first settlers brought rats. And the real problem with the rats is that the rats will eat tuataras more quickly mm. than they can reproduce because remember they live a hundred years. Sometimes it takes yeah. them over 10 years to reach sexual maturity. And mm. then they only produce young every two to five years after that. So this is the whole problem with sharks too. Sharks need to get super old before they can have babies, which is part of the problem why um, shark hunting can be such a big problem. They can also be pregnant. Some sharks for multiple years before they give birth. So it's a similar oh, life strategy oh. here that, that Where? they're, yeah. Where? What? Hmm? I, I, I got the solution. Yeah. Well, we can get rid of all these rats on the island by importing cats. Oh, great. Except for the cats, we kill all the cats are already killing numbats and other native marsupials to New Zealand. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. Yeah. Well, how so do these in, animals keep getting there? Humans. Ah, I got Blair. But yeah. No, I'm yeah. in trouble for that one. No, no that's that. no. no yeah. <laughs> Too late, I think, for that one. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so we have sequenced the Tuatara genome. We now think they diverged from lizards and snakes about 250 million years ago and have a lot of kind of a wealth of information located in this genome that is just waiting for us to study. So there's that pile of data that has all sorts of cool stuff that hopefully we can all benefit from in the future. Maybe there's some great genetic code that, that can prevent us from getting diseases. Maybe there's something else that can help me live to be 250 years old. We'll but, but the, 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 the part about that though, I'm a little suspicious about the diseases thing. Yeah. Is, is how many diseases is this lizard encountering? Yeah, in, in New, New Zealand. Zealand. Or are they like, are they like throwing stuff at these lizards? and like, they don't get this, they don't get that. Or just, they haven't, they don't seem to be getting sick where they're at. I, I think yeah, it's more that the, one. Yeah. yeah so yeah. so we don't, I mean, they're only, they only live on New Zealand. So yeah. put put one of those uh, two yeah. times in New York City, uh, living on the streets for a couple of months, and then, then look and see what diseases yeah. they actually can and can't get. That's what sure happens when they when they meet the New York City pizza rat, right? Yeah. Uh, I think the the New York City pizza rat would would win even faster. <laughs> the New York pizza rat would so be, yeah beat the New Zealand, New Zealand Although, jungle rat. Maybe getting so used to melted cheese, they wouldn't want to eat the pizza. I don't know. Melted it's cheese. It's not real mozzarella. Chips. It's not. They don't have no, that. No. Uh, so that's my, my story about the Tuatara. But also I have, I should have done this one first. I have to end the show on kind of a sad note. Um, no. Climate change. I have to talk about climate change. Um, or more specifically, the uh, redheaded stepchild of climate change, ocean acidification. Um, so we talk about all the CO2 in the atmosphere. We talk about climate change. We talk about the warming planet. We talk about the sea ice. 
But also we need to talk about what happens to about a third of that carbon dioxide, which is it gets reabsorbed by the ocean and it changes the ocean's chemistry. So the it's, it affects the overall pH of ocean water because there's all these little free hydrogens floating around. So anyway, uh, this is a study from University of Connecticut looking at fish's impacts, impacts on fish from ocean acidification. So when we think about ocean acidification, usually scientists aren't that concerned about fish because things like bivalves or sea urchins, they are extremely sensitive to changes in pH. But fish, as far as fish researchers know, ichthyologists know, is they are active, robust animals. They have a fantastic acid base regulatory capacity. And so they're not that worried about fish. Thankfully, there are still researchers checking that hypothesis. And so this was a study looking at a small, shorter lived fish called the Atlantic silver side. This is so they could study the fish across its life cycle across several independent experiments over the course of three years, rearing them under controlled conditions from the moment the eggs are fertilized until they are about four months old to see if there were effects from elevated CO2 conditions. They tested CO2 levels at, at two different levels, present day levels and the maximum level of CO2 in 300 years under a worst case emission scenario. So basically they had to take this fish that already was kind of tolerant to pH shift because otherwise they'd just kill a bunch of fish in the lab. They, they wanted some, some fish that they knew could were hardy enough to handle this experiment. And so um, they, they went for this worst case scenario so they could kind of overcompensate for that and see, okay, really, if the CO2 levels just totally spike, what's gonna happen? And actually, these fish, the, the ones that were exposed to higher levels of CO2, didn't grow as large. So we could see, hmm. potentially, the extrapolation here is you could see global fish populations shrinking over the, the course of this kind of longer longitudinal change in CO2 in the oceans. So this the reason this kind of caught my eye is that there have been lots of studies about mammals living at high altitudes shrinking mm -hmm. from climate change. And now let me clarify, individuals are not shrinking. The average size that that animal grows to is decreasing. So in the case of animals living on mountaintops, it's because uh, they actually are getting pushed to higher elevations because it's too hot where they're used to being. So they go higher up in elevation, there is less oxygen in the air. And so they have to kind of work harder to survive and grow and they don't grow as large. So within this case, the CO2 appears to just be a stressor that is reducing their ability to, um, to grow up as large. They also checked for uh, sex differentiation uh, because we've we've seen with other things that well, different frogs, chemical cues, yeah, turtles, right? Yeah. yeah, can impact that. And so um, there was no impact on the proportion of males and females by high CO2. So that is good. But again, if you rear these fish under ideal conditions and feed them controlled amounts of food, you don't overfeed them, then high CO2 conditions reduce their growth in measurable amounts. This is a deficit of about 5 to 10%, which in these teeny tiny fish is only a few millimeters overall. But the results are consistent, and that does impact biomass in the ocean, yeah. which does have overall impacts on ecosystems, yeah. food webs, all sorts of things. Not to mm -hmm. mention that if this is something that extrapolates to larger fish, that it could end up being a much bigger difference. So, um, so uh, what I find curious that. about this, and I would love to contrast this, we we had a wonderful conversation with somebody who was studying uh, shark scale, which are basically like tiny shark teeth, and mm -hmm. looking at different uh, ocean fish sizes uh, going back in time. I would love to correlate this with that because Megalodon was the largest shark that ever swam in the oceans. Uh, was there at like a 400, what's it per parts per, who's it, 
uh, that we're approaching now and mm-hmm. and our in the atmosphere. So if the largest shark that ever existed existed in a time when there was a high carbon uh, atmosphere, then then something must it must have been eating something well enough to so it, to uh, as as it usually comes down to with climate change, it's all about time scales. Mm-hmm. So that parts per million happened over a much longer period of geologic time. And so the animals that lived in the ocean had a higher tolerance for that higher parts per million. We're talking about in just basically a snap of the fingers, the pH completely changing in the ocean in a way that animals are not used to, and that being a stressor. What's interesting is this study looked back at previous studies looking at fish size in relation to carbon dioxide levels, where these previous studies didn't actually find a difference at all. And what they found was these studies were not regulating the amount of food that they were giving the fish. They were letting the fish eat their fill. And so it looks like the CO2 is a stressor. They were able to compensate for that stressor with additional food. But if you maintain the same amount of food that the non-stressed fish get with the stressed fish, then they do not grow as large. So it's it's all about these large scale changes that are happening quickly. Can animals adapt quickly enough to get used to this new normal? Can plants move fast enough to get back to where they're supposed to, you know, all this kind of stuff. So this is exactly what this is about, is in this kind of snap of the fingers, climate change, changing the temperatures on our planet, ocean acidification, changing the chemistry in the ocean in a way that is too quick for plants and animals to adapt to. I know. Just like the white dwarves, they're shrinking. They're shrinking. Yes. Poor little fish. Poor little fish. This It does remind me of a study looking at, uh, or many studies that have been looking at plants because plants take in CO2, put out oxygen, and the hypothesis has always been give them more CO2, the plants do better. And yes, in some studies, uh, the plants do start to have greater biomass, but they also start to have, if you're looking at food crops, potentially mm-hmm. reduced nutritional content. Mm-hmm. And it seems as though in, in many plants there is a limit to mm. the right. benefit of carbon dioxide. So it, the, the, I think there's, there's always some kind of limit that, that we're going to run up against at some point. But life is, life is like very plastic in a way, which I realize is a very oxymoronic thing to say. Life is very flexible, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Given enough time. Time. Yes. And that that's is the, really what it's all about. And cosmic Isn't rays. That's one of the things that induces <laughs> mutation in life and uh, allows it to try new weird stuff. So we just, we need more. Can we just, can the, can the iPhone app do that? Well, I'll just, just dial the knob up. Yeah, you want more? I got the control knob right here. I'll just, okay, yeah. Great. There's, there's cosmic rays, but also just quantum jittering can yeah. also create mutation. You're just making <laughs> things up now. Just. No, he's not. No, it's kidding. true. It's true. Molecular jittering. I just yeah. love that. It's so silly. <laughs> All right. So let's end this show on a fun, good note. I have a letter for our This Week in Science questions. This week, there is a what has science done for me lately comment Mm. included in this letter from Eric Combs. What has science done for me lately? Well, I went on a trip to Munising, Upper Peninsula, Michigan. I don't know if I pronounced that correctly. Thanks to the hard research work of geologists, I was able to learn about geological strata back in college. Thanks to chemists and other scientists, we were able to learn about the elements, especially those we see in geology, iron, manganese, calcium, copper. What am I driving at? Well, for me, science can enrich and enhance the beauty of nature. Science does more than propel us forward technologically. It can also help us find new ways to activate our PNS to reduce stress and bring enjoyment to our existence. Everything from tiny arthropods to giant celestial bodies beyond our atmosphere. Yoga and body mechanics, progressive relaxation and mindfulness. Science helps me appreciate the beauty everywhere around me, even in these tumultuous times of civil unrest and COVID-19. 
Knowledge is never a prerequisite for appreciating beauty, but it can help enrich the wonderment of everything around us. Science needs us to be to continue to explore the world each day with awakened curiosity. Science question. If science wasn't cool, then why is it possible to spell, to spell nerdy with the periodic table of elements? Nitrogen, erbium, dysprosium. Anyone want to take a gander at answering that question? <laughs> I think he just clarify. proved it. <laughs> clarify, it's, it's just nerd, not nerdy. Is that right? It's nerdy because it's, it's D Y S. Oh, is it? Okay. It's nerdy. Okay. It's nerdy. That's right. Well, to borrow Blair's answer, I have a a problem with the premise of the question, right? Because science (laughs) totally is cool. It is. Exactly. Always. It's like its own Mobius strip. If we can always, you know, the universe itself is cool. Nerdy. At the Kelvin scale. (laughs) (laughs) Cooling. (laughs) At every scale, at every scale, life is just improbable, impractical, and possibly everywhere, but also could not be anywhere else but here. How, (laughs) How can we be on this planet for this limited period of time and not be curious about observing the universe. How can we be on this planet for this limited amount of time as a sentient species and not want to learn everything that we can about it? How can we fixate so much on things that are just transient details that we made up to help mechanically make it through a day when all of this wonderful stuff is out there and this is the one chance we'll have to glimpse it? I don't know. I think we should probably... Dude, well, that, I'm doing a science podcast, so I'm, I'm maybe biased on what I find interesting uh, to think about while being alive on the planet. But uh, maybe that's yeah. the answer to the Fermi paradox. Maybe life is everywhere, but we're the only curious ones, and everybody else is just like, "Who cares what's out there?" <laughs> yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. Uh, I think we have made it to the end of the show. On that note, thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show. Thank you, Daniel, for joining us tonight. It has been wonderful to have you on the show to Thank tell you us about much. your work, Absolutely. to talk with us, explain the universe. It's been great. Where can people find out about you? You want to send them one place? Uh, yeah, just go to danielandjorge.com. You'll find our podcast there. Great. All right, it's time for shout outs. Shout outs to Fada for his help with social media and for for show notes in the YouTubes. It's always well done. Gord for manning the chat room, Identity 4 for recording the show. And I would like to thank all of our Patreon sponsors and the Burl's Welcome Fund for their generous support. Thank you to... I'm at the top of the list inside of the bottom of the list. Donathan Stiles, a.k.a. Don Stylo, John Scioli, Eric Combs, Flying Out, Guillaume, John Lee, Ben Rothig, Ali Coffin, Matty Perrin, Gaurav Sharma, Josiah Zayner, Mark Shoemaker, Sarah Forfar, Donald Mundus, Rodney Lewis, Stephen Alberon, John Ratswamy, John Ratnaswamy, Dave Friedel, Daryl Myshak, Stu Pollock, Andrew Swanson, Fred S104, Corinne Benton, Sky Luke, Paul Ronovich, Ben Bignell, Kevin Reardon, Noodles, Jack, Sarah Chavis, Paul, Jason Olds, Brian Carrington, Matt Bass, Joshua Fury, Sean and Nina Lamb, Sue Doster, John McKee, Greg Riley, Mark Hessenflow, Gene Tellier, Steve Leesman, Ken Hayes, Howard Tan, Christopher Rappin, Richard, Brendan Minish, Melisande, Johnny Gridley, Richard Porter, Christopher Dreyer, Mark Mazaros, Ardiam, Greg Briggs, John Atwood, Robert, Rudy Garcia, Dave Wilkinson, Matt Sutter, Philip Shane, Kurt Larson, Craig Landon, Mountain Sloth, Jim Drapeau, Alex Wilson, Dave Neighbor, Kosti Ranke, Matt Ulith, Matthew Litwin, Eric Knapp, E.O., Kevin Parachan, Aaron Luthen, Steve DeVell, Bob Calder, Marjorie, Paul Disney, Patrick Pecoraro, Gary S., Ed Dyer, Tony Steele, Ulysses Adkins, Brian Condren, Bridget Jason Roberts. <gasps> Thank you for all of your support on Patreon. And if you are interested in supporting us, you can find information at patreon.com slash this week in science or just click the patreon link at twist.org on next week's show we will be back on wednesday at 8 p.m pacific time or uh, thursday 5 a.m central european summertime 
<laughs> for you, maybe. Uh, I, mean, I think it's about right. Uh, I think it's Thursday. It could be the day before. I don't know how time works. Uh, we will be broadcasting regardless next week from our YouTube and Facebook channels and from twist.org slash live. Hey, do you want to listen to us as a podcast if you're not already right now? Just search for This Week in Science wherever podcasts are found. If you enjoyed the show, get your friends to subscribe as well. For more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes and links to stories will be available on our website, www.twist.org. And you can also sign up for our newsletter. Hey, you can also contact us directly. Email Kirsten at Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, Justin at twistminion at gmail.com, or Blair, me, at blairbaz at twist.org. Just put twist, T-W-I-S, in the subject line, or your email will definitely end up inside a supermassive black hole. You can also hit us up on the Twitter where we are at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Flying, at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you'd like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to you tonight, please let us know. We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show, remember... It's all in your head. <laughs> This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Cause this week's science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth. And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views. But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the science, you may just yet understand. That we're not trying to threaten your philosophy. We're just trying to save the world. Jeopardy. 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 And this week in science is coming your way. So everybody listen to everything we say. And if you use our method instead of rolling a die, we may rid the world of toxoplasma. Got me Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 Got a laundry list of items I want to address From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you've got But how can I ever see the changes I seek When I can only set up shop one hour a week This week in science is coming your way you better just listen to what we say And if you've learned anything from the words that we've said Then please just remember it's all in your head Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. science. This week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. science. This week in science This week this week in science, 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 this week in science. And we have come to the end of another show. 
We are here. We have done it. We made it all the way through. Daniel, thank you so much once again for joining us. My co-hosts have taken, they're taking care, Justin's taking care of himself, taking himself for a walk. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. Thank you very much for having me on. Um, what an experience. Yeah, I hope you had a good time. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I don't get to hang out with people and talk science as much anymore. So this is great. That's what right, that's well, one of the wonderful things about I think doing this is that we get to hang out and talk about science every yeah. week and yeah. Yeah. Well, that's why your show works cuz you guys have fun talking to each other so. Anyway, uh, thanks uh, for letting me be a guest. Nice to meet uh, you Blair and nice to talk to you. Yeah, and, uh, absolutely. It was and, super um, fun. Let's um cross over sometime again soon. Let's do that. This was really fun. Definitely. All right. Have, have a have wonderful a nice night. Time. Thank you. I don't know. Justin took himself for the walk. My droid, welcome. I'm glad you made it first time to see the video version. Welcome. It will be, it will be edited <laughs> for the podcast. Blair, mm -hmm. I just, I just have this question and I don't know if it's going to be uh -oh. different. <laughs> this question, me having a question. And I think people in the chat room, you can help with this. It, it, I, Really, do you think Justin is trying to make the show longer on purpose? Yes. <laughs> I'm like, what is this tangent? And what is that tangent? And it's another tangent. Well, it's, it's like it's, it's especially the short the quick stories. I think I think he doesn't understand. I'm trying to keep you know, it's like, okay, let's get through these stories before the half hour mark. Like that, like to get through all those stories before the half hour mark would be mm -hmm. awesome. Yeah, but I, uh, I know his, my droid, his tangents are wonderful. I do love his tangents. He's a thoughtful person and he's fun. But sometimes I think I wish that the tangents could be saved until the after show because yeah. this is when I'm like, yeah, let's talk about whatever. And, Meanwhile, tomorrow, I'm going to be spending half of my day, which has already got appointments and other things going on, trying to cut this show down to 90 minutes. <laughs> oh, I like this. Identity <laughs> Force said, Justin's train of thought stops at every block in the city. I think it does. <laughs> and we're stopping again. <laughs> Oh my goodness! Oh my so God. he can probably hear us right now. Just <laughs> I, I know he's he, no, he doesn't have his headphones on. He went to go. Oh, I don't yeah, know. I have to ask him. Be like, hey, hey. I know I need a buzzer, Thunderbeat. Here's here's my <clears throat> other thing. Is like, I would love to stay up till three a.m. with you guys talking about science, but, but I you also have to have get to up in the morning. <laughs> So I, I am here. I am here for it. And I love every minute of it. But like, there were a couple of those weeks that I went to bed at 1145. And it was a problem. <laughs> You're like, I it was it in the morning. It was it a real problem. <laughs> yeah. Let's we don't see. like we don't want to cause problems. We want to be. <sighs> Rat holes are wonderful. I know. The rat holes are fun. Yes, exactly. The three hour show. It was fantastic. But yes, I think all of us were very rough. tired the next day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, I know. Hi, Sadie. The cute Sadie. She's wandering. Yeah, she also you. doesn't like the three hour show. Because this is she's what? it's her bedtime. She's like Where woman. What are go you doing? To bed. <laughs> <laughs> this is not what you do normally. Yeah, where you are, Matajuro, it's already Thursday, huh? Oh, and you still have to do more business. Yeah, Identity 4, I try to do more business when the after show is wrapped up. There's YouTube things that I try to take care of so that... You know, the YouTube algorithms will pick us up and all those things that I try and do after the show. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, there's... Hi! Hello! Hello. So what's, uh, what's, uh, what's going on? What are we talking about? 
<laughs> my question <laughs> to Blair is whether <laughs> she thought that you're actually trying to make the show longer these days. <laughs> so, so fun yes. fact. Fun fact. <laughs> I have done my own independent study <laughs> of the time that people are talking on a number of twist shows. I went and start and stopped. And it turns out I actually talk less than the two of you. Combined? I talk faster. Yeah. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. I am th I'm third place in registered minutes on the show of speaking. I do uh, tend to extrapolate a, a particular story, but I also tend to bring about one less story on average than the two of you, mm -hmm. or two less, actually. Yeah. So that's I true. spend less time talking. I, but the, but then this is I, I like a serious thing. Like my favorite part of the show is is delving into sticking with that subject and talking around it. That's like my favorite mm -hmm. part of doing this. It, it's almost as if the stories themselves are seeds uh, for that conversation that can then come from it. So totally, I do extend your each of your particular stories or topics that you bring longer than just the coverage of the story. But minutes registered of talking on the show, not including the after show, which I seem to be rambling on about. Uh, I am the I'm in third place right now, on average. So I'm just gonna throw that out there. Keep that in mind. You guys might want to tighten it up a little. <laughs> I definitely talk the most. I bring the most stories, but I also try and I try and make them tight bites. And Blair tends so. to bring the same number of stories I bring plus the animal corner. So it's, you know, I'm, 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 That's I'm, not true. you know, I usually yeah. bring three stories total. I bring yeah. two animal corner and one and short one. story. Yeah. Is what I usually bring. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Mm -hmm. So maybe we're about even. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah. So. <laughs> Guarva <laughs> Sharma, thank you in the chat room. Justin, we were not talking mad trash about you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, because you Justin for... can't go back through the chat and scroll up and see what was saying, what we were saying. Oh, my droid. I he know. has lovely tangents. Thank you. Thank you. I identify four says tangents and a... cosines. If I if I can't tangent and sub reference, I have nothing to offer. <laughs> <laughs> what I do think life? though I think we need to like I think it would be nice especially when we have interviews to make sure like we were talking about this before that the quick stories are are nice and quick yeah because yeah, if we're gonna do like, that before the interview then I don't want them sitting around for a totally hour. agree and it's why I kicked one of the stories out I only did one in that in that first because uh, the first one already kind of had taken up what I felt should have been the time for two. And I knew that the next one was going to turn into Justin ranting because it's a <laughs> hot topic subject with me always. Right, right. So, so that's, that's exactly why I kicked the, that story to the, the second half. And then I had, to, I lost my other story because uh, normally I have what them with your computer. No, my, oh, so so this is this actually technically isn't my computer. My computer has been behaving much better. I found a little bit of a hack for uh, for the Chromebook. You hit mm. Control Alt T, then you write uh, ooh, either swap enable two thousand or enable swap two thousand. It puts a little bit of the hard drive into the like RAM, oh. uh, and it has sped things up. So it's almost Wait, the workable. Can you say that again? Because my Chromebook's really slow. Okay. Uh, Control Alt T takes you to uh, this typey word page. Uh huh. Okay. And then uh, you hit, uh, you type in enable swap. It's going to be swap enable, I'm pretty sure. Swap enable 2000, uh, which supposedly is going to use about two gigs of your. Uh, hard drive, which is probably pretty much all of it, um, mm. and, and allows it to do some RAM. But you mm. then have to you have to power off and restart your computer uh, to get it to work. So it's it has worked, but this was not the problem tonight. The problem tonight was.
for some reason, I have been getting kicked off the Wi-Fi at this hotel, which I've used many times. This, mm -hmm. this is not the first time we've seen this picture. Um, and what's weird about it is once I'm kicked off, it doesn't let me re-enter by going, like, pulling up the Wi-Fi, clicking on that, that Wi-Fi channel. It, it, the clicking doesn't work. It doesn't allow it to go into that. And I don't know if that, I think that's a problem, something with the Wi-Fi here, because it's never done that before. I don't know. Something really glitchy going on. Anyway, so I get kicked off. And the only way I could get it, I can't, you know, turning off and on the Wi-Fi, closing the browser, opening it doesn't work. The only way I could get it to rework is by <laughs> powering down the computer completely and restarting. Maybe it's an affect of using the hard drive as RAM. I don't know. Uh, hmm. But uh, pages were loading quicker until the very end. At the very end, things were still like a little laggy. But much better than uh, previous versions. I think the ultimate thing is at some point I'm going to have to get a grown-up computer. Uh, and I feel a little bit guilty having a Chromebook right now because like every kid in America needs one to needs go to one. school. Yeah. So, so if this is this just happened. My my uh, my elder daughter's computer stopped working. She's like, I can't get it to power on. It's been on the charger now overnight. It. it Totally lost power and now it won't charge and it won't start. Okay. Oh, no. So we went to like four different stores to find a Chromebook. Everybody's out. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, luckily, to school. yeah, I just I put it together. They're like, the timing of this is terrible. Everybody's buying a Chromebook. Fourth place we went had the exact one that we had looked at at the same store, uh, different store that we didn't have. So we got it. We got the exact one that she wanted. Perfect. So I got the old one because I'm like, hey, as long as it's broke, I can't break it more. Let me tinker with it. <laughs> uh, it was an odd model of Chromebook that had the power button in a different place. Hmm. It had never powered down completely the entire time she'd owned it. Mm. Uh. So it just it was just that. She just didn't we had the wrong power button. Anyway, so it works. She gave it to my youngest daughter. Now she has a Chromebook. So they both have Chromebooks. They're already both all set from for school. Perfect. But yeah, uh, I might need to get a, a grown-up computer uh, at some point uh, to continue to to because this is like an ongoing frustration with yeah. this uh, with this thing. Um, yeah, it's so funny though. I, you, the idea that you, it's it's the opposite of plugging it in. The IT help is like, have you looked on the other side of the computer for the power button? Yeah, well. <laughs> You know, it was just the thing is, I'm I was very poor in my first like look at this thing because there is a button exactly where the power button is on every other Chromebook, but it's like this lock button, so you can like I guess quickly lock yourself, uh, you know, uh, do that like change user thing. You just hit the button, mm -hmm. and do it. but it's in the exact same position, and I'm like, it doesn't make sense that they would use a different symbol on your one weird Chromebook than all the others. Uh, but it's an emergency. She's got like this meeting. She's got to do because she's like a kids in school. Like they're she's like a little corporate exec. She's like, I have a mm -hmm. meeting at one o'clock. I need a functioning computer, otherwise I'm going to miss the meeting. So we're like racing through like all over two towns, four stores, find it, get her online. Off she goes to her meeting, and then later the next day when I'm playing with him, like, oh. There it is. Okay, it works. It works. There you broken. go. <laughs> it's fine. Which, which turned out... Uh, oh, and I also got a new phone, of course, that I've been dealing with. Uh, I did need to get a SIM card, but I didn't... This was, You did. I okay. did actually have to Dang. order a new one because huh. my old one was out of date. Uh, oh. And they don't have the E1 for this phone or through this carrier. Anyway, so my youngest daughter this week got a hand-me-down Chromebook and a hand-me-down iPhone. It's not even close to her birthday. I don't even think it's like near her half birthday. And she's she's like raking it in right now. Children's computers. Oh, we're back in that role. I think. Is it time for bed? Oh. Yeah. Hey. Claire's done. Uh, when are you leaving? Next Monday. Next Monday. Oh, man. I sent you mail. I hope you get it before you leave. Oh. I won't. 
You oh, I might. I, might. I sent it on Monday. Okay. That Actually, one to you might. too, Kiki. Postal service? <laughs> Maybe I know. Not. Hey, <laughs> I bought $150 worth of stamps a couple weeks ago. There you go, USPS. <laughs> Um, so I'll check. I'll look out for that. Uh, also, uh, next time you see me, I it don't know be... what condition I will be in. Yeah, you're going to be, be fresh to Denmark. I'll be jet lagged. You will be. Something crazy. Yeah. <laughs> it'll be one of those. It'll be one of those. Do I take like melatonin and try to sleep in what would be the middle of my afternoon? Or do I just try to stay up until the next night and not sleep for a, a whole rest of the day and then that. just sleep naturally at the end of the night? That's yep. probably the better choice, isn't it? That's what I usually do. Yeah. Just stay up and collapse. Yeah. Just drink so much coffee. That's what I usually do. I just like pump coffee into my ba- veins for like this, this 36 like my hours every day. straight. And then, <laughs> well, I have actually, I used to be like a three cups a day coffee drinker. And now I am one small cup a day. And it's because I'm wearing a mask for eight hours straight. So you, I can't be just sipping on coffee sipping all coffee. day. Huh. So I drink one cup of coffee with my breakfast before I leave for work. And that's it. That's all I get. Um, once I start working from home again next week, I might get back like up coffee. there. I need to. I need to buy some like decaffeinated tea so I don't re-addict myself to the level of caffeine I was used to before. Because I feel pretty good now. Like it's taken the whole summer, but I feel like the one cup of coffee is doing me now. Just you wait. It'll want you to have more. It I does. Know. The coffee says you should drink more. <coughs> drink more coffee. Because in tight. Thank you. But, you know, if, I mean, if life plans go correctly, then, like, in a year, I'm going to have to wean myself off coffee anyway. So. Life plans. <laughs> oh, the plans of life. Yes. Yes, you will. Or, yeah. Hmm. <laughs> What is it that uh, Johnny says when you sneeze? Science! Johnny. My friend Jojo Johnny. Oh, Jojo. Jojo, he says. When you I sneeze, forget his name is Johnny. <laughs> instead of saying Gesundheit or bless you, he says, science! That's great. Which is good. I am. Um, what is. There is one. Oh, uh. The ones that say like to health, I like that because that's like, that's just yeah. Like, oh, I hope you're okay. <laughs> now, what is it? The French a Yeah, to your to your health. To your health a tesoué, Well, to everyone's health, a tesoué. Guarv Sharma asked me, uh, "What uh, takes you to Denmark all the time?" Uh, I go to Denmark for the warm weather. <laughs> what brings most people most places? Love. True love. Yeah. I may have been misinformed about the weather, but <laughs> stayed anyway. <laughs> Denmark warms your heart. Yeah, it does. Yeah. And actually, and actually, right now it is warm weather. They've been having like uh, 80 degrees, 90 degree weather even. 80, 90 degree weather. And fun fact about Denmark, nobody has an air conditioning. No building has an air conditioning. So when it gets to be 80, 90 degrees. It's like Portland. Yeah. The, the forecast for where I am right now, mm. Central Valley, Yellow County. Hot. 103, 105, 107, 103. It's it's going to be. Dry heat. Yeah. What does that mean? (laughs) What the heck? It means it's not Florida, where you feel like you just got out of the bath 
And then you're also yeah. walking through 100 degree heat and yeah. you can't yeah. breathe because it's so humid. That's that's Sorry the to least, Floridians that that's are the this. least by the way, that's the least problem that Florida has. <laughs> yeah. Sorry to Floridians again. <laughs> My cousin no, no. lives in Reading. Floridians, Reading no, said they've been living with Floridians. They know. My cousin's he took a photo of the thermometer on the wall. He said it was 108 in the shade in Reading. It's too hot. Sadie, excuse Do you. <laughs> she just, she just bit the microphone stand and went. <laughs> <laughs> no more microphones. She's like, no, bed you're, time. Ma. You're done now, mom. All right, all right, okay. <laughs> Say good night, Blair. Good night, Blair. Say good night, Justin. Oh. Good night, Justin. Good, good night, night, Kiki. Kiki. Good night, everyone. Safe travels next week, Justin. We'll see you. I hope that you're not too jet lagged. Everyone have a wonderful week. We'll be back again next week with more This Week in Science. We'll see you then.